Hi, everyone. Good morning, good evening, depending where you are. I'm Marty Murray. I'm Chief Curriculum and Content Officer for Target Test Prep. And I spend a lot of time working on verbal. Today, we're going to be talking about how to master GMAT verbal. And I could, I want to preface this by saying that the preparing and effective preparation is really going to get you to your score goal, no matter where you started from. I learned that myself. I'll tell you a funny thing. When I started preparing for the GMAT, I had no idea that scoring 800 on the test was supposed to be so hard. I saw other instructors who had done it. So I just prepared. I did what everybody does. I learned the best preparation methods and ended up scoring 800 on the GMAT. So effective preparation will take you wherever you want to go on this test. And before we start, I want to say that, as you probably know, over the past couple of months, more than 4 million refugees have read that have fled the Ukraine and millions of people that are living in Ukraine have been uh, displaced. So our session today is going to benefit several charities doing really important re work right now to help Ukrainian refugees. So please donate to the fundraiser if you can. Any amount will help. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate it if you could help with this cause because it's super important. Uh, also, regarding this particular session, at intervals during the session, we're gonna be giving out GMAT Club test subscriptions and uh, 24 10-day target test prep subscriptions. So if you are interested in having the great GMAT Club test or access to our target test prep course for 10 days to uh, brush up on your GMAT skills, then stick around for these. Uh, the prizes, we'll be doing them after each segment. We'll be starting with sentence correction, moving to critical reasoning and wrapping up with reading comprehension. And uh, as we do each, we're going to give away those prizes. Uh, today, so what are we going to do today? We're all here. We have three hours to work with. So the idea for today is it's just going to be a master class, okay? So I'm sort of assuming that you know some of the basics. If you don't, we'll cover them a little bit. You'll understand. And you'll also get a sense of what you need to learn to master a GMAT verbal. And we're on the other, at the same time, we're going to be doing this sort of from an expert perspective. We're going to see how an expert would handle a lot of these questions. We're going to assume that you know some of these, uh, you know, some of these key terms, some of the modifier things, some of the, you know, the concepts for critical reasoning, those type of things. And we're going to hit these. Um, we're going to hit these questions and look at them with an expert eye. Look at, you know, really break these things down and analyze them. And I've also picked the questions with the intention of each one has a specific thing we can learn from it, okay? So it's something that you might not see somewhere else, you know, something that you almost might uh, disagree with some of the rumors you've heard about GMAT Verbal. We're gonna, so we're gonna look at these questions with the eye, like, well, what, can, what key thing can we take away from each one to really get a chance to, to master GMAT Verbal and take our scores to the next level? So with that in mind, Let's let's hit it. Okay, so we're going to begin by just talking in general as a reminder of what GMAT verbal is. And, you know, you might get the impression that GMAT verbal is a grammar test, or you might be get the impression that GMAT verbal is an English test or a reading test. But when we, if, if we had to call GMAT verbal one thing, we call GMAT verbal a fairly sophisticated logic game, okay? It's a logic game. And it's key to understand that because a lot of the things we hear about how to prepare or, you know, what GMAT verbal is, don't really focus on this idea. And it's easy to get the sense, like I said, that GMAT verbal is maybe a grammar, you know, just if I learn enough grammar rules, I'll get this, I'll, I'll rock a GMAT verbal. Or if I learn a lot of uh, patterns for critical reasoning, uh, you know, I can just, if I know the right patterns, I'll get critical reasoning questions right. Or if I know keywords for RC, I'm gonna get all the RC questions right. This is a misconception. GMAT verbal is a logic game. Okay, so what we really have to be prepared to do 
is use logic to get these questions correct. So when you're preparing, let that color what you do. If you realize that you're preparing for a logic game, then you're going to prepare effectively because you're gonna use logic through everything you're doing. You're gonna have in mind, am I using logic? Am I learning to use logic? Am I improving my use of logic? Am I getting better at this logic game? And if you pre prepare that way, then you're gonna be preparing in a way that's gonna get you to your score goal. So let's talk a little bit more about how the moves we can do make for winning this game. Okay, uh, the first move is to learn rules and concepts. True, it is a logic game, but like any game, uh, we need to, this game requires us to learn the rules. If we don't know the rules and we don't know the concepts, it's going to be pretty hard to play the game. That said, the rules and concepts are not the game, right? It's a game, it's a logic game. So it's not a memorization game. Yes, we want to memorize a few rules for the game, but it's not a memorization game. It's, you know, and there's plenty of people that know all the rules that are not hitting their score goal in GMAT verbal. So learning the rules and concepts is super important but it's not the entire thing. The second thing we want to do is learn strategies. And there's a lot of reasons why we learn strategies, and we're going to talk about this more as we go through this session. But, the, you know, if we not only are we going to learn rules and concepts, we want to learn how to apply the rules and concepts. So certainly we're going to learn strategies that allow us to effectively apply these rules and concepts as we go through G, the GMAT verbal section, right? The strategies are going to be key. If we have good strategies, we're going to be ready to rock. And the third thing, and this is really important too, is practicing effectively. Okay. And and when the, the big the big part of this is the effectively part, because we can all answer a thousand, two thousand verbal questions. And the question is, is that practice going to get us to our score goal? Right? Are we going to practice in an effective way? And we'll talk about how to practice effectively as we go through here. But we definitely have to practice effectively. And, and the more we know about how to do this, the more we're going to know what effective practice is. So I'm going to discuss practicing at the end. But we definitely have to keep in mind that practicing effectively is going to be a huge part of it. Learning rules and concepts is great. Learning strategies is great. And then practicing effectively is what's going to lock in it for us. So let's start by hitting SC. I picked these SC questions with the idea, as I said, each one is going to show us something, something interesting, something you might not have seen, something that might disagree a little bit with what you've heard. And we're going to learn, we're going to start getting really into the expert mind, you know, the mind of an expert in sentence correction. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's, you know, go back to our foundation of how to master sentence correction before we hit these questions. And you know, this is starting to resemble some of the things we just talked about. So we definitely want to learn sentence correction rules and concepts. And this is really maybe the section where learning rules and concepts is the most important because there are so many sentence correction rules and concepts that we need to know if we're going to do this effectively. I mean, if you didn't even know at all how a sentence works, it would be pretty hard to analyze a sentence and see whether it worked, right? So we definitely need some rules and concepts. But I'm here to tell you that it's not as hard to remember these rules and concepts as you might think. And the reason is that the rules and concepts are mostly logic based, right? So when we're learning sentence correction rules and concepts, so many people say to me, I see it all the time in the target test prep chat. They say, you know, the GMAT is required, you know, for the GMAT, it seems as if I have to know so many GMAT sentence correction rules and concepts. And how am I going to remember all these? You know, this is crazy. I start forgetting them. Well, here's the deal. If you learn the logic of them, then it's not going to be as hard to remember them. For instance, the word everyone is always a singular subject. And if you just memorize that, I, you'll probably remember it. But it's much easier to remember if you, uh, if you say, well, wait, every one. It's one person. So one is naturally a singular subject. Another rule is that if they're commas, around a modifier, it's non-restrictive. It's called a non-essential modifier. Well, we could memorize that, but we can also take it to the next level and say, well, gee, if commas are kind of like parentheses, so naturally, if you put commas around it, it kind of takes it out of the sentence. So that kind of indicates that it's a non-essential modifier. So this is logical. 
you know, most of the rules and sentence correction are logic based. Why does a modifier have to be close to what it modifies? Because otherwise you can't tell what it modifies, right? Why does a pronoun have to have the same number as the noun it refers to? Because that's the way you can tell what it refers to. So all these things are very logical, or most of them, 90% or 95% are very logical. So it helps us really to remember these sentence correction rules and concepts if we see the logic stuff. The second part of sentence correction, and this is this is a this is interesting for all of us, it's to learn to read sentences literally and determine whether they convey meanings that make sense. And you know, this is different from how you read a, a, a sentence anywhere else. Because normally, no matter where a sentence is, we want to try to read and understand what the author meant. You know, if somebody's writing an email to us, I don't know, a client or a coworker or a friend, we certainly want to know what that person meant. Not necessarily what their sentence meant if we read it uh, literally. You know, that would be pretty interesting some of the time because we don't all speak perfect English. And so if we read everything literally, uh, it wouldn't work out. But on the GMAT, we have to change it up. We have to read all our sentences literally. And this is something you have to get used to, right? It's saying, if I read this literally, what does it mean? Right? And this is huge. And we don't do it anywhere else. You know, I mean, if you, unless you're an editor somewhere, maybe. But you get what I'm saying. We read these sentences literally and determine whether they convey meanings that make sense, okay? Does this sentence say something that makes sense? So, you know, once again, GMAT sentence correction is not just about rules and concepts. It's also about just understanding whether the sentence conveys the meaning that makes sense. And there's so many ways they don't make sense and there's so many little tricks. So there's no way to memorize them all. What we want to do is just get used to reading what, you know, reading it literally and determining way. If you read this, 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 this is saying that like, you know, the monkey was walking the dog. That's, I don't think that's what the, uh, the sentence was meant to say. Or this says, I don't know, the dog is wearing a Speedo, if you've seen that in the Target test. I don't think that's what this writer meant to say. It doesn't make sense. So finally, to master sentence correction, we practice to develop skill in noticing issues in sentence versions. Okay? So, you know, this is what we're learning to see. We're learning to notice so we have to practice doing this, right? So once we learn the rule and learn to read sentences literally, we have the, so much of this is just practicing to notice what's going on, okay? What is going on? Something is an issue. You know, you see like, wait a minute. And you start off blind. You know, we all we start off blind. We read two sentence versions. They all, I mean, in the beginning when you do this, whoa, they all look the same to me. You don't even, we don't even notice the issues. But as we practice, it starts to come into focus. And then, you know, after you've answered, I don't know, the first 50 sentence correction questions, you start going, you know what, this looks funny. Something's going on here. And then comes the second thing we're practicing is articulating exactly why the choices are incorrect or correct. And I mean, exactly. This is the key thing because, you know, you know how it goes. Well, I don't like this sentence. <laughs> it sounds funny to me. Or, uh, you know, I don't know, there's something about this that seems a little off. Well, this is a fairly sophisticated logic game. So saying that something seems a little off is probably not going to get us to the correct answer, you know? We have to ar learn to articulate exactly. So we look at it and go, the meaning conveyed by this sentence is nonsensical because this modifier is telling us that the dog is in the speedo. Okay? So now you've nailed what sentence correction is. And if you're using the target test prep course and you've read our explanations, you'll see, you know, how to, how to exactly do this. And you don't, you know, those OG explanations don't do that. But, you know, if you see a really solid explanation, that's what you have to learn. Basically your goal and when you're practicing SC is to learn to come up with those kind of explanations yourself. You want to become the explainer. Okay. So that's what we're going to be talking about too, is becoming an explainer of SC questions. So we're going to hit some now. And learn to do this. I see a few questions coming in, so let me see what's going on. Let's see. Okay, you're stuck in the 30s. We are going to get you higher, okay? We're going to get you. We're going to break you out because we're going to take you to an expert level today. Okay. 
Okay, let's see if there's any other. Some specific stuff. You know, guys, if you have the super specific questions, maybe you can, um, maybe you can, uh, yeah, you know, hit me on the TTP chat or email me for the super specific questions. Uh, cause we're going to have, we're going to, we have so much to do today, but, uh, if, if basically, if you want to get your score higher, yeah. If, if someone said, if I want to get a 31, do I need to get 700 level questions? Correct. Uh, maybe a couple, I don't know, maybe some of the easier 700 level ones. You can't miss many verbal questions and get a 30 score. You know, it's not like quant. We have to get a lot of questions. Correct. So let's now hit a few questions and start seeing how we can do this at an expert level. And we'll start with this one. If you know this question, I'm warning you, I changed the choices around. <laughs> so let's give it a couple minutes on this, everybody. Uh, and if you please share your answers in the chat, but do it in, just give everybody a couple minutes to look at the, uh, the question without any bias. So please hold off on sharing your choices until we get a couple minutes. Yeah, hold up. Just hold up. Let everybody do this on their own, on his or her own, I should say, to be grammatically correct. Um, but anyway, you know what I'm saying. Okay, we have a few different choices here, and let's discuss this question. So how are we going to handle this? The first thing we're going to do is read the entire sentence, the original version. So it says, the British sociologist and activist Barbara Wooten once noticed as humorous example of income maldistribution that there was an elephant giving rides to children at the Snay Zoo. And it earned exactly what she earned as director of adult education for one. Okay. So that's pretty interesting. The first thing I notice about this sentence is there are absolutely no grammatical errors. And that's a lot of the point of this question. That's why I'm bringing this up because we could learn all the grammar rules in the world and not get this correct. But there are some rules we need to know and there's some things we can do. So let's start, We and one of them is by, uh, one thing we need to do is keep in mind the, uh, the non-underlying portion of the sentence. So let's read these choices and consider them in the context of the non-underlying portion of the sentence and see what they mean. Because look at this. A, there was that there was an elephant giving rides to the children at the Whipsnade Zoo and it earned. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, right? Nothing wrong with it. So how are we going to figure out what to do here? We have to keep in mind the non-underlying portion of the sentence. So what does it say? 
the British sociologist and activist once noted as a humorous example of income maldistribution that there was an elephant giving rides to the children at the Whipsnade Zoo. Is the fact that there was an elephant giving rides to children an example of income maldistribution? No. So A isn't logical. Okay, so there's one issue with A. So this is not an example of income maldistribution, the fact that there was an elephant giving rides. Where's the income maldistribution would have to show that income, something is wrong, and it doesn't say that. Secondly, this is a, you know, a funny rule, but it says that there was an elephant and it earned. This is a poor connection, okay? And we discussed this a little bit in the target test prep course. A sentence should be, and we're, should be connected. The ideas should be connected. So what's happening here is this is saying that the British sociologist noted that there's a humorous example of income maldistribution, which is supposedly this first part. And then we have this other part of the sentence, and it earned. See that? It's not really, can, and it earned exactly what she earned. Who is saying that? It's just another clause tacked on. This is a fairly sophisticated thing to see, right? But this is a fairly sophisticated test. So if we want to rock SD, we need to see little things like that. Is that clear to everybody? Like Barbara Wooten noted this, that there was an elephant, but this second part of the sentence is not well connected to it. And it earned. So who is saying? She noted that there was an elephant giving rides. And by the way, it earned something. And okay, great. So is the writer, why would the writer say these two separate ideas without connecting them? It doesn't make sense. Okay, there's another thing we can notice here that this, this particular version has a particular meaning. And a lot of people talk about in sentence correction that the original version, the original intended meaning should show up in the correct answer. But does this, does this meaning make sense? No, right? So there's no way this is gonna show up in the correct answer. Okay, so A is out and we're not gonna carry the intended meaning. Yeah, I mean, clause, the second clause, someone's asking, isn't the clause to an example? The, the second clause is actually, it earned exactly what she earned. That would be sort of the fact that an elephant earned what she earned would be an example of income maldistribution. But the that, we need the that to connect this to her, okay? We need the that. So there's no that here. This is just and it earned. This is a separate idea. This is not what she said. If you want to say what someone said, you need that. Okay? So like in E here, we have a second that. Okay, let's go to choice B. This isn't the hardest question ever, but you know what? What is hard is, you know, a lot of people got this correct, but what is hard is analyzing it. Okay, so let's talk about that. Someone just mentioned what level is this question? I think it's a 600 level question or a low 600 level question anyway. It's not particularly hard, but here's the deal. Did it, how many of you saw that the second clause did not work with the first one, right? If you didn't see that, then you can say, well, this is an easy question, I can get it right. But when you're practicing, you wanna go through every single sentence correction choice and understand exactly what do we see, articulate exactly why it's incorrect. So how cool is that? that even though this is a fairly easy question, we can learn so much from it. And that's what you want to do when you're practicing sentence correction, okay? And that's the purpose of this master class is to take things, to show you how to take things up a level. So if you're like, well, why am I scoring, you know, I don't know, I can't, my score is not going up because, you know, you, you, how or how can I get my score to go up? You can do it by practicing in this way, by articulating exactly what's going on in every choice. If you get this question correct, but you didn't know that part about the clause, well, you haven't, you're not an expert. Yeah, I can get it right. You might, you know, if you get it down to the last two choices and guess, and I get this all the time, you know, people tell me I get down to the last two choices and I kind of guess. Well, if you get down to the last two choices and kind of guess, you're going to get 50% correct, theoretically, right? So you're already winning. So the fact that you got a question correct does not mean that you're ready to score high on GMAT level. What you want to be able to do is see what we just saw. Let's go to B. Okay, the British sociologist and activist 
Barwood once noted at a humorous income example of income attribution that the elephant, okay, giving rise to children, had been earning exactly what she earned. Now we do have an example of a humorous example of income maldistribution because B does work with this beginning part of the sentence by saying that the elephant had been earning exactly what she earned. I'm going to keep this one. We're going to get rid of the easy outs first. Okay, let's get rid of the easy outs first. Let's look at C. Uh, uh, Barbara Wooten once noted as a humorous example of income maldistribution that the elephant that gave rise to children at the Whipsnade Zoo was earning exactly what she earned as director of adult education. That makes sense too. Let's keep C. It's not an easy out. D. Uh, Barbara Wooten was noticed at a hum once noted at a humorous example of income maldistribution. The elephant. Do you see what's going on here? It's nice and concise. The elephant that gave rise to children at the Whipsnade Zoo and was earning. It's certainly parallel. The elephant that gave rise and was earning is parallel. It's all perfect. It's grammatically correct. But an elephant is not an example of income maldistribution. So D is an easy out. E, the, uh, she noted the elephant giving rise to children at the Whipsnade Zoo is a humorous example. And that it earned the same thing she was earning. Look what this sentence did. It broke up the elephant. And the, this certainly, the fact that the elephant earned exactly what she earned on the end of C, I mean the end of E rather, is certainly a reason, a humorous example of uh, income maldistribution. But, she, you know, we broke it up. We broke up. She noted the elephant as a humorous example and that it earned. Wasn't she giving one example of one thing? Yes. E is out. All meaning. Notice once again, grammatically perfect. Notice how sophisticated we're being about this though, right? Like we're not just saying this choice is parallel, so it's correct. Or this is grammatically correct, so it's correct. We're analyzing carefully the meaning and we're articulating exactly why these choices are wrong. So now let's go back to B and C. C says that the elephant, she noted as a humorous uh, example of income maldistribution, that the elephant that gave rise to children. So this is a restrictive modifier. This is a restrictive modifier. I lost my pen. Uh, you know, the elephant, so this is a particular elephant, the elephant that gave rise. And this one is the elephant giving rides to children. Notice what's going on here. This is saying the elephant. The elephant? Is there one elephant on the planet? She noted that the elephant giving rise to children. So this elephant doesn't always give rise to children? Which elephant are we talking about? A non-restrictive modifier set off by these commas doesn't restrict which, uh, which elephant we're talking about. So if we know our modifier rules and our concepts, notice that wasn't enough just to know the rules and concepts because, okay, fine. There's nothing grammatically wrong with this. The modifier is not misplaced. It's fine for an elephant to give rides, you know, I mean, unless you disagree with having elephants do anything like that. But you know what I'm saying? It's, it's logical that an elephant could give rides to children at the Whip Snade Zoo. So that modifier is not misplaced. There's nothing blatantly wrong. But if you know what a restrictive modifier and a non-restrictive modifier does, you say the meaning is off. This Okay, so we have the elephant is giving, and when it's giving rides, and it had been earning. Well, that doesn't make sense. There's not the elephant. So let's look and see again. The elephant that gave rides, this is restrictive, as we said. So this particular elephant that gave rides was earning exactly what she earned as director of adult education in life. So we can see out of the infamous two last two choices that C is our correct answer, right? The elephant that gave rides and was earning, and was earning, right? What do we do? We were fairly sophisticated about this. We took an easy question and we just spent 10 minutes on it. And this is what you need to do in your practice. I've seen people that blow through the questions. They get 80% correct in a minute each. And they're like, well, why am I not scoring 45 in a row? Because, yeah, you can get 80% correct in a minute each, but you can't get 100% correct. And you're not learning by doing them in a minute each. Okay? So what do you do instead? 
get 100% correct or 95% correct, get 20 correct in a row and spend five minutes each or 10 minutes each, analyze them the way we just did. This is how you take your verbal score to the next level by being able to articulate exactly what's going on. Okay, I got a bunch of questions coming in, so let's see what's going on. Someone asked if uh, target test, you know, if anybody, any third party can write questions as well as um, as the GMAT. Yes, the answer is yes. The people at the GMAT are people. The people at a third party company are also people. So yeah, people can do what people do. And by the way, uh, at target test prep, you know, people say, well, the, the GMAT spends thousands of dollars on every question. At target test prep, we just wrote a bunch of new sentence correction questions. We had the first person wrote them. They were they were then workshop, re-edited. We put them in the course. We saw the, the statistics, edited them again. Another person reviews them. So we have a similar process to what goes on in the uh, for the creation of real GMAT questions. And that's why our questions are pretty tight. Uh, let's see what else is going on. Does target test prep categorize the questions? Yes, we do. We categorize them by difficulty and even by type, by uh, by error type. Okay, let's see. We appreciate all the donations, peeps. Okay. Someone asked me, I mean, had been earning does sort of works, but sort of doesn't work. She noted that the elephant giving rise at the, at the zoo, I mean, had been earning. I, it's not insanely incorrect. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's continue on. Next question. Remember to hold off with your, uh, with your answers um, before, until everybody gets a chance.
Okay. Let's go through this one. It's a tricky question. It's a 700 level question. So if you thought it was a 500 level question, you probably got it incorrect. But before we do that, I want to just wrap up one thing that a couple people asked about uh, in the past one. In this question here, they said, well, isn't some this modifier with commas around it, okay, in B, giving rise, it, it's a non-essential modifier. You know, there's a few things we could learn about this, and I'm not going to go into all of them right now, but it does modify both the subject and the verb of the clause. So that the elephant giving rise to the children had been earned. There's another issue with it. Uh, but it's not, it's, it's not, you know, the main issue with this, with this is it's just non-essential. It doesn't, it doesn't tell us which elephant we're talking about because it's separated by these two commas. Okay. So it doesn't say which elephant we're talking about. It just says the elephant giving rise to children, giving rise to children is just telling us a little more about what's going on because it's between commas. It's not modifying. It's not specifying which elephant, although it is modifying the elephant in a way. If, but you need to learn, if you don't get that, you need to learn about your present participial phrases, okay? Let's move back to this question. Okay, number one step, read the original version. Over 75% of the energy produced in France derives from nuclear power, while in Germany, it is just over 33%. Oh God. This one might be one of our easy outs. I see a pronoun in it and it's the pronoun it, and I have, you know, don't you get the vibe I bet you all did that it, what it, what is it logically referred to? Okay. Now here's the thing about it. We're going to take this to a sophisticated level. A pronoun like it refers to an entire noun phrase. Okay. There's some other kinds of pronouns that don't do that. Those and that do not do that. They can refer to just a piece of the phrase. So for instance, those could refer to energy. Okay, but it refers to the entire preceding idea in it. Okay, okay, so it has to refer to something that a noun, the whole idea of a noun. So, for instance, this would refer to 75% of the energy produced in France, that it could refer to that, or it could refer to nuclear power. Those are two possible nouns that it can refer to, but notice it doesn't just refer to energy. So this it refers to this whole thing. And if we know this, okay, then we can see that this it doesn't make sense at all because it doesn't make sense to say while in Germany, 75% of the energy produced in France is just over 33%. It doesn't make sense. If we, if we replace the it with this, we get insanity, right? Or if even if we replace it with nuclear power, while in Germany, nuclear power is just over 33% of what? Like, what is that? You know, I, it's just not a well, it's not an effective sentence. And this it kills it for us. This is an easy out. Getting rid of our easy out. Okay. B, I bet it's going to be an easy out too if we know our comparison rules. Over 75% of the energy produced in France derives from nuclear power compared to Germany. You know, I don't know. So the energy, which uses just over 33%, this is comparing 75% of the energy produced in France with Germany. It's an easy out. Not that many people picked it. If you know your comparison rules, you're going to get this. You're going to get rid of A, uh, B. And if you know your uh, pronoun rules, you get rid of A. So notice, we're taking a concept and applying it. Reduce, you know, okay, let's move on. C, whereas nuclear, over 75% of the energy produced in France derives from nuclear power, whereas nuclear power accounts for just over 33% of the energy produced in Germany. I'm not sure how much I like this because this one starts off with energy produced in France and it says it derives from nuclear power. And this starts off with, starts off with the opposite, starts off with nuclear power and ends with Germany. So they kind of aren't similar. I mean, it does sort of make sense. I'm going to keep the choice, but let's see what else we have. Uh, D, whereas just over 75% of the energy produced in France derives nuclear power, well, whereas just over 33% of the energy, whereas just over 33%, 
of the energy comes from nuclear power in Germany. You know, this sounds, we have 75% and 33% and nuclear power and nuclear power, right? So this matches up, the two clauses match up. So, I, you know, that sounds pretty good too. It's not an easy out. This is how we do it. We get rid of the easy outs. We keep the, the infamous last two choices. Okay, let's check E. Over 75% of the energy produced in France derives from nuclear power. Compare with the energy from nuclear power in Germany, where it is just over 33%. We got an it again. What do we learn? The it refers to the entire thing with the nuclear power in Germany. So the energy from nuclear power in Germany. That's what it has to refer to the entire thing. It can't just refer to energy. It has to refer to the whole idea, the whole noun phrase. So let's see, let's plug that in. Compare with the nuclear energy from nuclear power in Germany, where energy from nuclear power in Germany is just over 33%. Makes no sense at all. We can get rid of this choice. I see another error too, where it is just over 33% of what? I don't know, right? Over just over 33% of what? Who on earth knows? It doesn't, it's totally meaningless. So we're down. We're down to D, C, and D. Now, a lot of people pick D, and I can see why. Because this starts off with energy produced in France. This starts off with 33% of the energy here. Then we jump from nuclear power and nuclear power here. It looks parallel. It looks perfect. And we've all heard the comparisons have to be the same. But let's really look at what D says. We have, Remember what we're saying? We're articulating. We're noticing issues. We have to notice an issue with D says, whereas just over 33% of the energy comes from nuclear power in Germany. What energy is it talking about? I mean, this choice isn't looking good anymore. You know, everything else lines up. It's all grammatically correct, and it kind of lines up. But what energy is the energy? We're picking up on an issue, and let's articulate it. It's unclear what energy we're talking about. So this we would articulate. D looks correct. It's grammatically correct. It's parallel. But we don't know what energy we're talking about. So maybe we're going to, you know, maybe C works. Let's compare the differences, you know, the difference. Let's check the difference between C and D. They both start with whereas. Does this work? Whereas nuclear power accounts for just over 33% of the energy produced in Germany. C is absolutely clear, whereas D is not. So C is actually starting to look correct. And if you're sitting there on the test, you should be picking up on this and saying, you know, I don't really like C because nuclear power comes at the end of this clause and the beginning of this one. And Germany comes in France and the energy, you know, and energy in G France comes at the beginning and Germany comes at the end. So what is going on? You know, I, the 75% is here and the 33% is later. So they don't seem to match up. But here's the deal. If you know your rules, you know that whereas does not work like unlike. Whereas is different. What comes after whereas is a whole new clause. So this part of the sentence, that part of the sentence doesn't have to match the, the first clause. They don't have to match perfectly when they use whereas, okay? They don't have to match. They are two separate clauses. If you know this, if you know your sentence correction rules, then you know that they don't have to match. So actually C is fine. D doesn't make sense. C is in the game. And we just got this question correct. Because of what? We knew our stuff. We knew about these pronoun rules. We knew about this pronoun rule. We knew about our comparison rules. And we also picked up on this crazy little issue, this subtle little issue. So it did turn out not to be a 500 level question after all, didn't it? So we got some questions on this one. Yeah, okay, so the, uh, the this this is uh, covered in the target test prep. Uh, yeah, it is com it's covered in the comparisons chapter. So you need to know that. And you know, it's, it's t once again, it's totally logical. Whereas is connecting two clauses. This is a whole clause. 
it, a clause can express an idea just fine without looking just like the one before. I don't have to say John went to the store and Jim went to the store. We does, do we always write like that? No, we say like John went to the store and he happens to like it, or John went to the store and then later a house burned down. Two clauses don't have to match exactly right. So don't get this. But what did the GMAT do? They checked to see whether you would notice that. They checked to see whether we would notice that whereas is connecting two clauses, it's not like unlike. Right? They're going to do this to us constantly. This is called, uh, as we know, a trap choice. Right? They're trying to fool with us to make us think that they have to look the same. Do you notice? So sentence correction in most of GMAT verbal is about noticing what's going on and using logic to arrive at the right answer. The idea is a nice trap. It looks so nice and parallel. Okay. So we all get that. So, you know, that was a, another takeaway that the GMAT is going to make the incorrect answers. This choice certainly looks nice, doesn't it? It certainly looks nice. It's nice and parallel. It all seems to match up. You feel good. It's all grammatically correct, but we had to take it to the next level. And that's the difference between scoring 35 and scoring 45 on verbal, right? Well, you know, if you see these basic things, you're going to get into the 30s. You want to get into the upper 30s and 40s. You have to take it to the next level. Okay, next one. Okay, fine. We'll go back one last time. D is not correct because it says... Over 75% of the energy produced in France derives from nuclear power, whereas just over 33% of the energy, what energy, what energy is that? What is energy is this? The energy, 33% of the energy comes from nuclear power in Germany. So is that the energy in France? It sounds like it, but 75 and 33 adds up to over 100. Or it's maybe the energy in the planet. I don't really know what energy is that. It's a subtle issue, but we're looking for effective sentences. And if someone wrote that sentence in a, in a book, you read it, be like, well, what does he mean? It can't be like that. We're looking for effective sentences, and it's not an effective sentence.
Okay, let's go through this one. What do we do? First step, read the entire thing so we get a sense of the entire sentence. So they can't smoke us by having choices that look right, but actually don't fit the whole thing. Okay, according to some analysts, the gains in the stock market reflect growing confidence that the economy will avoid the recession that many had feared earlier in the year and instead come in. We need a little underlining here. Instead come in for a soft landing followed by a gradual increase in the business activity. Okay. So it's a basic sentence. And, and the key thing, according, this, according to some analysts, we can kind of ignore this and say the gains in the stock market reflect growing confidence that the economy will avoid the recession that many have feared. It looks pretty good, that the recession that many have feared earlier. So we're going to keep that. Let's go to B. Growing confidence in the economy to avoid the recession, what many had feared early in the year, rather to come. That is starting to look like a mess. But there's a reason why I brought this question up. And I'm bringing it up because it does something that we need to, it's a cool thing that GMAT does. I call it right idiom, wrong place. Notice what they did here. Growing confidence in the economy. Certainly, we've all heard the idiomatic structure. Growing confidence in X. So a lot of people choose this choice because they say, well, it totally makes sense. Growing confidence in the economy. But the problem is this idiom is the wrong place. We don't say growing economy, confidence in the economy to do something. We, if we're going to say that some, the growing a confidence that the economy will do something, we say it the way A says it. Okay, so the reason I brought this question up is to show us about this thing called right idiom, wrong place. So yeah, we can all learn our idioms. We can learn our rules. We can learn our structures, but we have to learn how to apply them. And the key thing here is we can, it doesn't make sense to say growing a confidence in the economy to avoid the recession. This is not how we use growing, a confident, growing confidence in X. We don't do that. Also, this is a little awkward. What many had feared to avoid the recession, what many had feared. I mean, I guess it's sort of okay. And this rather to come is really insane. Uh, when we see something rather, X rather than Y, we have, so we could get rid of this. That's one technique we can use is get rid of a modifier and see what it says around it. Growing uh, confidence in the economy to avoid the recession rather to come in for a soft landing. That's completely bonkers. Choice B is gone. Let's say to avoid rather to come. You know, we might say to avoid but rather to come, to avoid and rather to come, but we don't say to avoid rather to come. Okay, C. Growing confidence in the economy's ability to avoid the recession. Now we have growing a confidence in the economy's something. In the economy's something, right? If I ever learn why it does that, that'd be great. Uh, in the economy's ability, so we can have confidence in something that perfect. So now we're using the right idiom in the right place to avoid the recession. Something earlier in the year, many had feared. Look what they did here. They're saying something earlier in the year, many had feared. But we're talking, so something, look at this modifier, earlier in the year, something earlier in the year. So they feared it because it was something earlier in the year. It doesn't make sense because we're talking about growing confidence in something that will happen in the future. So this was not earlier in the year. Is this an obvious misplaced modifier? No. Is it a meaning issue if we read it literally? Yes. So let's do this again. Growing confidence in the economy's ability to avoid the recession many had feared and instead to come in for a soft landing. So we're talking about something in the future, not something earlier in the year. We have to pick, read the sentence holistically, right? We're reading the sentence holistically saying this is about the future. So this is recession is not something earlier in the year. It's something many had feared that would happen, or, you know, and it would happen in the future. But by the way, the earlier in the year, we does come near uh, many had feared, but is this sentence effective? No, right? We're looking for an effective sentence. So we just articulated why this is wrong. It's not something earlier in the year. And you know what? We could say, well, maybe early in the year applies to many had feared because it's close to it. I don't know. Doesn't it read something earlier in the year? 
Yes, absolutely. Okay, it doesn't say many had feared earlier in the year. If we had that modifier over here, it would work fine. But that's not where it is. It's right here modifying something and something refers to recession. So it's something, it's saying the recession is earlier in the year. Clearly it's in the future. C for that subtle reason is F. Next, D, growing confidence in the economy to avoid the recession. Look what we have here again. We have this growing confidence in X misused, right? Once again, right idiom, wrong place. We can say growing confidence in the economy. But we can't say growing confidence in the economy to avoid. We would have to say growing confidence that the economy will avoid. Right idiom, wrong place. If you know about that, it saves you a lot of trouble because you won't go through and just say, oh, it's idiomatically correct. Yeah, it's correct to say confidence in X, but it's not correct to say confidence in X to avoid. That's not the way we use it. We say, you know, we use it like the way it's used in C. Okay, we have one last choice. Growing confidence that the economy will avoid the recession that was feared earlier in this year by many with an instead coming. Okay, look what, you know, man, we had to read this choice the whole way to the end because we see this with it instead coming. And on the GMAT, when you see with, something should actually sort of be with something. You know, there's either two ways something can be with something. You either use it, <laughs> I hit the nail with the hammer, or you could say, or there are a few ways. One of them is to say, I did it with this. Another one is to say, John is actually with Sue or, you know, Steve is with Alvira or whatever it is, but we don't use it this way, that the economy will avoid the recession that was feared with it instead coming. The economy is gonna avoid the recession with something. You know, it's not it's just not well expressed. And you know, is it awful? Is it insane? No, but let's compare. Now we have two choices. We got, we're got we down to the infamous last two choices. Growing confidence that the economy will avoid the recession many had feared early in the year. Look here, the fear early in the year is right by fear. And instead come in, perfect. Why would we choose anything else? Growing confidence, the economy, that was feared earlier this year by many. That's a little funny, but fine. It has the passive voice, look at that. That's okay though, it's okay. But the width kills this thing. This is just not as good as what we're seeing today. I don't really know what, the economy will avoid with it instead. So the economy will avoid with it instead. What does that mean? How does the economy avoid a recession with something? Doesn't make sense. It's not quite logical. It's just a little off. A works better. That's the way we get rid of the infamous last two choices. We're down to A. A is correct. Checking for your questions, and then we'll move on. Okay, so everyone gets this one. Great. The meaning of E is a little off. It just doesn't make sense to say the recession was feared earlier. The, the economy will avoid the recession with it instead coming. It's just not a great way to express it. It's not an effective sentence. We're looking for effective sentences. On to the next one. This one, once again, teaches a great lesson.
Okay, let's hit it. Start by reading the entire sentence to get a holistic feel for it. Although Napoleon's army entered Russia with far more supplies than they had in their previous campaigns, it had provisions for only 24 days. Okay. Although Napoleon's army entered Russia with far more supplies than they had, I'm a little questioning, and this is, we're going to blow through this question. But if I were, if you're looking at this on the test and you were a little stumped, you might say, you know what, far more supplies than they had seems to work with army pretty well. You know, I mean, could army be plural? Maybe. You know, I don't know. Sometimes those collective nouns, it seems okay. So I'm going to move on to the next choice. All the Napoleon's army entered Russia with far more supplies than their previous campaigns had had. You know, it's a little, I don't like that one as much, but I don't know. Why couldn't this, they have more supplies than their previous campaigns had? I don't like it as maybe as much as A. Don't see a clear reason to eliminate it. C. All the Napoleon's army entered Russia with far more supplies than they had for any previous campaign. I don't like that for, to be honest, they had for any for any previous campaign, but it's not the worst thing. So what am I going to, you know, okay, how about D? All the Napoleon's army entered Russia with far more supplies than in their previous campaigns. I don't like that one at all. So I'm going to get rid of D, okay, because I don't think the supplies are in the campaigns. And E. Although Napoleon's army entered Russia with far more supplies than for any previous campaign. My first instinct, really, to be honest, is to get rid of E because this is an awful comparison. They entered Russia with far more supplies than for any his previous campaign. So you know what? If it were up to me, and I'm taking the test, E is gone. I kind of don't like C because it as much i really like a the most but you know what these all seem to work far more supplies than they had in their previous campaigns far more supplies in their previous campaigns it had far more supplies than they had for any previous campaign and when this happens to you and it probably will one of the things you have to do is go did i really read the non-underlined portion of the sentence and if you notice, I didn't. I only read the beginning of the non underlying portion. But I didn't read the end. And this happens to me all the time. So that one of the big lessons with this is when you see three, two, three choices that all look good, you might not have read the underlying, non underlying portion of the sentence. And as soon as I read the non underlying portion of the sentence, I see, what do you see? And I think a lot of you did see this. It says it, it had provisions for only 24 days. Well, we suddenly have a big clue here that the army, it must refer to the army. Well, by the way, you can't have the army be singular and plural at the same time. Either we're using this as a group noun and you're saying it's they, or we're using that as a singular noun and saying it's it, but it can't be both. You know what just happened? A is gone. B is gone, C is gone, E is gone. Well, we eliminated E because it's an awful comparison. They entered Russia with far more supplies than for any previous campaign. I don't know, man. Is that a really good comparison? Would we ever write it like that? Do you expect it to be that way? Wouldn't we see far more supplies than they had, far more supplies than they entered with, something like that? Far more supplies than for any previous campaign what for what where's that what does that connect to entered for you know there's no real great way to do this but by the way we're looking for the best choice not for a perfect choice so even though we checked off and said e doesn't work we have to change our mind lesson number three about this question is that sometimes the choice we're so confident is wrong it's going to turn out to be the correct answer. And honestly, there's just no way any of these puppies up here are correct. They, they, there, they, there will not go with it. Right? There's no chance. They're all gone. The only possible one is the one we all probably wanted to eliminate because it's a bizarre comparison. 
E is correct. Is it perfect? Is the way we write the sentence? No. Is it the best? Yes. So their biggest lesson with this question, well, there are two huge ones. If you're choosing, if you see three choices or two choices or a bunch of choices that look correct, go back and make sure you read the non-interline portion. It's going to serve you so well. I mean, I've been doing this for ages and it can still, I mean, you know, I don't know if I'm making a mistake, but I see two choices that look right. And I go, aha, let me check the non-reliant portion of the sentence. And that will take me out of that, that dilemma so often. So you're like, well, maybe I have to guess between these two. They don't, you know, oh, man, these all look the same. I hate this question. Check the non-reliant portion. And the second lesson is be, or the second lesson is be ready to reselect a choice that you already eliminated like this one here. Be ready to select. And this goes for critical reasoning, reading comprehension, and sentence correction, okay? That you often will eliminate a choice. Keep it in your back pocket. Keep your eliminated choices in the back pocket because you may need to de-eliminate them. And then finally, the final, the final lesson here is the correct answer to a sentence correction question is not always perfect. So don't be quickly eliminating choices because they have a little, oh, I don't like this comment here. You know what I mean? And say, well, that's gone. It's gone. And then you choose in between the last four choices. It may not be a perfect choice. So we have to be ready to handle imperfection. So if it has a little bit of imperfection, eliminate it last. And also be open to the idea that the correct answer could be pretty messed up like this one. What is that? You know? But by the way, by the way, I'm not saying that this question is unanswerable. Because the other choices are so clear. These have fatal errors. This, these plural pronouns are fatal errors. These are gone. There's no way we can choose these choices. So even though the correct, the so-called correct answer is a little freaky and not the best thing, we can eliminate four and definitely get this right. Okay, so it's not, is it subjective? Not really. There was a correct answer that we can all see. Okay, we're gonna take a break for a minute. Uh, there's gonna be a link in the chat where we can, where you can enter to win the prizes the uh, GMAT Club test or the 10 day target test prep subscription. So anybody that wants to enter to win those prizes can do that now. Okay, just, uh, we had a couple questions. Somebody asked about ellipsis. There's not a great ellipsis here. Uh, you know, I don't know. Although Napoleon's army entered Russia with far more supplies than for any previous campaign, I mean, far more supplies than, su I guess maybe we could say there's some kind of ellipsis with supplies than supplies for any, it doesn't really make sense. Honestly, and I've seen this a few times in these, you know, these, these uh, SC comparisons, you know, we all learn all these great comparison rules and how it should be logical and how to use ellipses. And then they pull this, you know, man, it's just, what are you going to do? You just got to get, you have to get it right. And they're going to do that a little bit. Uh, the questions aren't always, the, the correct answer is not always perfect. Okay. Let's move on to critical reasoning. Now that we've blasted sentence correction, we're going to do something similar with critical reasoning. We're going to learn, uh, we're going to see some cool things and some questions. We're going to take critical reasoning to the next level. We're going to take it to the V40 levels. Uh, someone was asking if you're using a target test prep course, when should you start doing time practice? Uh, if you're working, and the answer is if you're working this way, you know, go for the high accuracy and try to work the time, start trying to work the time down. Don't necessarily cut yourself off at a minute 48 per question on average or two minutes per question. 
start working the time down. Can you get it down to two and a half minutes per question? Can you get it down to two minutes per question? Just try to work the time down. Then nearer to your test, you know, when you start taking practice tests, you could do the literal time practice. But your first step is really just to practice driving the time down. And by the way, if you're doing this analysis and you're doing this on time practice, you're going to get fast anyway. The time almost becomes irrelevant because you become so skilled and so clear about what's going on in these questions and articulating all these issues and knowing how to use the strategy. The, the time becomes irrelevant. Okay, so let's talk about how we master critical reasoning. And it starts off sort of like how we master sentence correction. You definitely need, you know, there's some concepts that if we know them, they're really going to help. Concepts such as the parts of the argument. Like if you know that some part of the argument is an assumption, if you know about the support, if you know what's the conclusion, if you know how some of the keywords work, it's certain we're, you're certainly going to be starting off in a good place in critical reasoning, okay? So you definitely want to learn some concept. Okay. The next thing, and this is super important in critical reasoning, is learning effective strategies for answering critical reasoning questions of each type. And then, here's the thing. You know, a lot of time we can get them right, and we can, uh, by just doing whatever, reading the passage, you go to the choices, you pick up on the answer and why it's right. For sure. But here's the thing. If you learn some effective strategies, then when they start getting harder, you're going to have a clear pathway, clear things you need to do as you proceed through the question. It helps a lot. Like if you know to read the passage first, read the question second, and then let's say it's a weakened question. Okay, so I read the question. Now my next thing to do if it's a weakened question is go back and identify exactly what the, exactly what the conclusion is. It's just so much clearer than if you just read the passage and help your scout to go to the answer choices. You know it's a weak question. You know, okay, it's supposed to do this. If you know, okay, I'm going to read the question and then I'm going to read the conclusion and I'm going to identify that. It's going to solidify what you're doing. Okay. And the other thing is with strategies are so key because when we take the test, if we have an effective strategy and you, let's say you get distracted, you know what you're supposed to be doing. So no matter how, if you're nervous or distracted or tired or rushing, you know what your strategy is. And if you've been doing this all the way along as you've been practicing, then when you get to the test, you're going to, you know, you're going to do what we just said. You go to the passage, go to the question, go to the conclusion, go to the support. You're going to know exactly what you need to do. So this, you're not going to flail around. And, start, you know, we've all had that experience when you're seeing a verbal question. Like, well, I don't even know how to proceed here. I don't even know where to start. I'm nervous. I'm tired. The proctor is making a lot of noise. The guy next to me is tapping the desk. If you have that strategy all lined up, you know exactly what to do, and you're not going to run into those issues. So learning effective strategies is not only going to make you more accurate and more effective, it's going to make you more efficient because you're going to know what steps you need to take. You're not going to be cruising through the question, you know, looking up and down, trying to figure out what's your next move. And if something distracts you or anything goes wrong, you're going to fall back on the strategy. You're going to instinctively know exactly what to do. So learning effective strategies is huge. Finally, as we do with any other type of verbal question or any other type of uh, GMAT question, we'll practice to develop skill in analyzing the relationships between answer choices and passages. So practice is key like it is with any other question. And in critical reasoning, we're practicing analyzing the relationships. Notice it's not where it didn't say practice answer critical reasons questions in a minute and a half each. Right, we're analyzing. We're gonna and we're gonna see this as we do these questions. We're gonna carefully analyze these relationships. That's what you're doing when you're practicing critical reasoning. So once again, if you know all, if you get a question correct, but you haven't done this, then you're not really practicing critical reasoning effectively. You you know yeah you vibed your way. You got you you know you sort of figured out why ch choice C is correct. But you didn't analyze the relationships between the choices. And you know what? Yeah, you can get uh, uh, an easier or median critical reason question correct, sort of vaguely or helter-skelter. But if you want to nail the, uh, the hard critical reasoning questions and master critical reasoning, okay, then you have to learn to analyze the relationships between the answer choices and the passages. We're going to do that as we proceed. So let's go. Question number one. Remember to uh, wait for people in case you've seen this question before. Don't put your choice in too soon. Give everybody a minute or two to get through this, please.
Okay. Looks like we have a conservative consensus. We gotta have a lot of votes for one choice and a few votes for some others as well. So let's go through this. And and we're gonna use a strategy, and we're I'm gonna show you an interesting thing you can do as well that uh we can help with no matter how hard a question is. And it's using arrows and direction. So this question, we'll read the passage first. I always say to read the passage first. I know a lot of people would like to read the question first. More power to you, but uh, I personally, uh, you know, if that works for you, that's fine too. But I read the passage first just because if I read the question first, I'm thinking about the question as I read the passage. And I personally want to pick up on all the details, these little things in the passage. And if I read the question first, then I'm sort of thinking, well, what's the support? Like if it says, like this question says, cast the most doubt on the effectiveness. Well, now I know it's a weakened question, so I'm going to be looking. What's the support? What's the conclusion? If I just read the passage on its own without doing that first, then I'm going to probably pick up on little details like this. Since the deregulation, delays have increased by 25% at the in increasingly busy airports. Isn't that interesting? All these little details have increased by 25%. To combat this problem, more of the takeoff and landing slots at the busiest airports must be allocated to commercial air. Okay, so we read the passage. We get the idea, the general idea, that since deregulation, delays have increased by 25%. To combat this problem, more of the takeoff and landing slots must be allocated to commercial airlines. Okay, so this person's conclusion is that in order to combat this problem, we have to allocate takeoff and landing slots. Right. So which of the following, if true, cast the most doubt on the effectiveness of the solution? So we know this is a weekend. We're casting the most doubt on the effectiveness of the solution. What is the solution? Now we go back to the passage and make sure we totally get it. The solution is more takeoff and landing slots must be allocated. What's the support? The, the airports are busier. And delays have increased by 25%. Okay, notice, does this person say, therefore, does he use does he use keywords? No, okay, but we can tell what the basic conclusion is and why this person thinks this is true because the airports are increasingly busy. Now let's go through these choices. And here's the key thing. We're gonna, we're going to, uh, we're gonna analyze the relationships between the choice and the passage. In order to do that, we really wanna consider direction. So this person is saying, what has happened? Delays have increased. So we're going to put a direction on that. Delays increase. So now what should we do? We should allocate more takeoff and landing slots. So we're going to increase takeoff and landing slots. And we can do this all with arrows. How cool is this? Then the delays are going to decrease. That lays out this passage so well. Did we need to take a thousand notes? No. But we just saw delays have increased. We can increase takeoff and landing slots, and therefore delays will decrease. That's this person's idea. So let's look at A, at E. Since deregulation, the average length of the delay at the biz nation's busiest airports has doubled. Average length has doubled. So what kind of arrow? This gives us an up arrow, right? Delays have increased. You notice what this, what is the relationship between this choice and the passage? And we can ease this. There's a million ways that, uh, you know, they could say, I don't know, it's irrelevant or something, but let's define the relationship because if we define the relationship, then we're going to be sure of whether we should uh, uh, eliminate it, you know, and especially in a harder question, we really need to define that relationship. So this is saying the delays has doubled. So here's what they were and now they're up twice. Okay, great. This just qualified our up arrow for delays, didn't it? It's it's the relationship between this choice and the passage is it qualifies the passage. Does qualifying the passage cast doubt on the effectiveness of the solution? No. Okay. Let's go to D. After a small Midwestern airport doubled its allocation of takeoff and landing slots, the number of delays decreased. So this is saying allocation went up. Decrease went. Oh boy, nice. <laughs> Sorry, it's saying allocation went up and delays went down. Well, that's exactly what we want to happen. Does that decrease our? Uh, 
Does that weaken our argument? No, it's saying that something exactly what we want to have happen did happen. So clearly, this goes in the wrong direction. This strengthens the argument. That's the relationship. Is it irrelevant? No. Right? It's totally not irrelevant. Even though someone can say, well, this is a small Midwestern airport. Okay, it's a little, it's a little, it's a little off target because a small Midwestern airport is not our uh, our target here. We're talking about the nation's increasingly busy airports. You know, I don't know, but this is a small Midwestern airport. You can say maybe it doesn't apply, but honestly, if it does anything, it strengthens the argument. So that's the relationship. Notice what we're doing. We're not just going through irrelevant, irrelevant uh, or word matching, or this is this talks about the same thing as the passage. We're actually defining the relationship between the choice and the passage. Okay, C. Over 60% of the takeoff and landing slots in the nation's busiest airports are reserved for commercial airlines. Well, this definitely has a relationship with the passage. This tells us how many slots we can do if we allocate more of the takeoff and landing slots. And what it really tells us is that 40% are left. Because if 60% are used, there's 40% left. That's a lot. So that, if anything, I would think this kind of strengthens the argument. If anything, because it tells us there are a lot of takeoff and landing slots. So if we allocate more, we can allocate a lot more. I don't know. Does it really, anyway, it certainly doesn't weaken the argument that 40% of the slots are left. And that's what we need to do is weaken the argument. So this, how about B? Since airline deregulation began, the number of airplanes in operation has increased by 25%. What's the relationship between this choice and the passage? Anybody have a, uh, idea what what the relationship of between b and the passages because uh it's an interesting one and it doesn't matter so much for a weekend question okay b the relationship between b is it explains why since deregulation, the number of airplanes has increased. This explains why delays have increased, right? Delays have increased because the number of airplanes has increased. It explains it. And often, an answer choice will explain. And a lot of time, they do this in the strengthen question because an answer choice that explains seems to strengthen the argument. So it's that's, you know we can see how important it would be to understand that a choice explains what's going on. So this is what does it explains why the delays are the number of airplanes has increased okay cool that explains why delays have increased but we're not trying to explain it are we we're our job is to cast out on the on the effectiveness of our solution so this choice is out okay so that leaves us with a and a lot of people don't pick a because why because it says the major causes of delay are bad weather and overtaxed air traffic control equipment. So a lot of people say, well, if these are this is about bad weather and overtaxed air traffic control equipment, it's not about landing slots or about increasingly busy airport. It doesn't say anything about landing slots. It doesn't say anything about deregulation. It talks about bad weather. It's irrelevant. Well, here's the deal. We already eliminated four choices. We have, and the real, the real thing with the correct answers to, to critical reasoning questions is not to look for uh, wording matches or quite, you know, I don't know. The correct answer often looks irrelevant because they use wording that looks different from what it says in the passage. And why would that be? Because the correct answer has to provide new information. Especially in a weakened question, we need new information. Otherwise, the plan looks good. Like, for instance, okay. Choice E gives us the same information we already had. That's not new information. Okay, this is giving us more information about the situation, but it doesn't really, this is not telling us something earth shattering why our plan is gonna work. This is explaining what's going on, but you know what? This is giving us totally new information. And totally new information is often what's gonna rock our argument. Like, wait a minute, most of the delays are because of bad weather, man. You can give them all the landing slots you want. And you know what? It's not going to combat the problem at all because most of the delays are caused by bad weather and overtaxed air traffic control equipment. So I don't know if your plan is going to work. We just destroyed our plan with new information. Absolutely destroyed it.
right? Okay. So this is out. A is our correct answer, okay? So once again, notice what we did. We read the passage, we read the questions, then we went back to the question, to the passage rather, to see what was going on. And then we went through and checked out the relationships between the choices in the passage. We didn't just go through and look for wording or relevance or relevance, this looks the same. We nailed this thing. We knew exactly what's going on with each choice. There was no way once we did that. Once you analyze the relationship with each choice in the passage, there's no way you're getting it. So correct answer is indeed A. It's a 600 level question. It's not, a, we're going to do some harder ones next. Okay, let's move on. If you've seen this one in TTP, please don't just jam your answers before everybody gets a chance. Got a couple of different choices are pretty popular. Any other ideas? Okay. Let's go through this one. This is a tricky one. A lot of people miss it. And uh, really, this is going to highlight so much why we have to pay so close attention to the conclusion of these questions. Let's read the passage first. Longview Prep board member. Okay, they often do that. Uh, start off with the person. Over the last five years, the school's administrators have noticed an increase in drug use. Okay, so we have an up arrow, right? An increase in student drug use. And there has been simultaneously a drop in average of our scores. Okay, so we have a down arrow. Interesting. 
dropped and scored. On state issued test of general knowledge, I see a detail. This is a little suspicious, right? State issued test of general knowledge. Why is it so specific? Clearly, if we can reduce student drug use by incorporating drug use awareness classes into Longview Prep curriculum, we will increase the averages of long-term view, Longview Prep students state issued, once again, state issued test scores, it's interesting, to levels at which they were five years ago. So look, it starts off saying something about five years, we saw drug use go up, test scores go down. So now this person is saying, if we can reduce drug use, then test scores will go back up. Interesting. I mean, as soon as we think of it that way, drug use went up, test scores went down, we reduced drug use, test scores can go up. We realize this guy is assuming that there's some kind of connection between test scores and drug use. Who knows? Right? So, okay, let's read the question again. Next, which of the following is an assumption on which the support for which the board for the board, for members' conclusion depends. Okay, so we have to go back. It's in this. So we have to identify an assumption. An assumption, as we know, is something that has to be true for the evidence to support the conclusion. So this evidence is that over the last five years, we saw an increase in drug use, and this conclusion is, and and the averages in the test scores went down. Okay, so now if we reduce drug, if we increase the, uh, excuse me, reduce drug use, we will increase the averages. Sort of makes sense, but what is this person assuming? Okay, and now there's a key thing we're going to have to notice with the conclusion. The conclusion is not that we're going to reduce drug use. And this is why we read the conclusions carefully in critical reasoning questions, okay? The, the, does you see anything about it that says we're going to reduce drug use? Nope. It says, if we can do it. So the real conclusion is, if we can reduce drug use, the scores are going to go up to the level they were at five years ago. If we can reduce drug use. So if we, we have to be so super clear about the conclusion. If you miss a CR question, a lot of times you'll look back and say, you know what? I didn't identify the conclusion. And we cover this in the, in the TTP course. And you know your error tracker does have a spot to say, I didn't identify the conclusion because identifying the conclusion is so key. Let's look at choice A. The students who use drugs the most would not leave Longview Prep and enroll in other schools because they prefer not to attend drug use awareness classes. So we're going to, you know, so this is an assumption that we're not going to lose the students who use drugs the most. I got a question. What, what is our conclusion? The conclusion is we will increase the averages of state issued test scores. Do we have a reason to believe that the students who use drugs the most are the people that score the highest on the test? Why would it matter if these people leave? The answer is it wouldn't. And nobody said, by the way, the conclusion is not that we're going to get everybody to stop using drugs. So if you picked A, you might have been thinking, wait, how are we going to get these students to stop using drugs if they leave? Well, the conclusion is we're not going to stop. It's not that we're going to get them to stop using drugs. The conclusion is if we can reduce drug use where drug use at our school, then the averages are going to go up. And by the way, the fact that the kids use drugs the most leave the school is not necessarily going to keep the averages from going up. In fact, it might even help. So if A is not true, if A is not true the plan might work even better. The kids who use drugs the most just leave. Okay, fine, either way, we will have reduced drug use and the averages may very well go up. I don't really know. It could be the kids who use a lot of drugs score very high, whatever. But the point is we don't have to assume these. We don't have to assume these kids won't leave. Now, there's another reason why people choose this choice. They think, well, this is an alternative cause of an increase in test scores. Well, kids, so then you know, this is an alternative plan or something, an alternative cause. They say, well, this is a cause and effect argument. If we can reduce drug use, the cause, then we will have the effect will be the test issue test scores will go up. This is an alternative cause. Some people say, well, the kids are actually just going to leave. Well, that's not the way we do these questions. Okay. Yes, it's good to know about alternative causes. It's absolutely one of the, co the concepts you should learn for critical reasons. But we don't just throw these concepts willy-nilly at these questions, okay? 
So you can't, you see what I'm saying? A lot of, you know, it's so easy to go, well, I know it's a cause effect thing going on here. And this is an alternative cause. The kids are going to leave instead. So therefore it's, you know, this is the assumption. He's assuming there's not an alternative cause. This is, we have to look exactly at the question, not just pick up a pattern. The reason we learn those things like alternative causes is so that we're aware of them. We know what's going on. We're, when we get to the game, we're ready to play. We know what's going on in the field usually, but it doesn't mean that that's exactly what's going on in this question. And in order to get this question correct, we have to identify exactly what's going on in this question. Not just look at a pattern, A is out. B, over the past five years, Longview Prep has not changed its curriculum by shifting the primary focus from imparting knowledge to development of critical thinking and research skills. I don't know. I don't even know what that has to do with it. And when I don't know, I keep the choice. Okay, and critical reason, when you don't know, keep the choice. You know, I don't know what this is doing. I don't know what this has to do with it. Well, fine, if you don't know, then keep it. I don't see, but keep it, right? I don't see the connection, keep it. C, long view prep students who use drugs are not able to hide their drug use from teachers and administrators. Okay, a lot of people choose C, a lot of people choose C because they think, well, if they can hide their use of drugs, then we may not be able to reduce drug use is the conclusion that we can reduce drug use. No, right? The conclusion is if we reduce drug use, then we'll get state issued test scores to the levels that they were at five years ago. No one said we're guaranteed to reduce drug use. There's, you know, so we don't really care if they're able to hide their drug use. The whole question is if we do it, we'll get this result. That's the person's conclusion. So if there's problems, then yeah, we won't do it. But you're not really arguing with me. You're arguing with the fact that these classes are gonna work. There's another issue. Do we really need to be able to see whether the kids are able to hide their drug use? If they can hide their drug use in order to decide whether these classes are gonna work, right? Drug use awareness classes. Do we need to see whether they're using drugs to, for classes to get them to stop using it? No. So this C is out for two reasons. D, test focus review sessions would not be effective in increasing long view prep student scores on state issued tests of general. Okay, this is, we've all heard of this, the alternative plan choice, you know? Well, okay, my plan is if we can reduce drug use, then their test scores are gonna go up. And someone else says, well, test focus review sessions would be effective too. Does that mean my plan isn't gonna work? So the relationship between this choice and the passage is it gives me an alternative plan, okay? And by the way, I have a question. What if they would be effective? What if test focus sessions would be effective? Would that mean that the scores are not gonna go up? So this goes in the same direction as my argument. If someone said, well, test focus review sessions would be effective, great. Well, I have even more reason to believe now that we can get these state issue test scores, if nothing. I mean, you know what I'm saying? We're, we're trying to say, what, would, what is, why would this not work? Because test your focus review sessions, they would only help. So D is out. E. Most students who use drugs will not eventually reduce their drug use on their own without having to attend drug use uh, awareness classes. We're having attended drug use awareness classes. Right? Okay, a lot of people pick E because you're saying, wait a minute, we don't need to do this. But the, the, what's the conclusion of the argument, people? The conclusion is that if we reduce drug use, we can get the scores up. Does the guy ever say that there's no other way to reduce drug use? The drug students won't reduce drug use on their own. I mean, God only knows also, when is reducing drug use on your own? I don't know, 30 years later? By the time they graduate, is that gonna help? But anyway, leaving that aside, the conclusion is that if we reduce drug use, the scores are gonna go up. Do we, does it get wrecked? What if we took out this not? Most students will eventually reduce drug use on their own. Does that wreck my plan? No. So the relationship between this choice is saying, I don't know, he's assuming there's no other way things could work out, right? Is this is another way things could work out. It's kind of an alternative plan choice, kind of like D. Well, it doesn't matter if there's not a way, another way things could work out. All this person is saying is if we reduce drug use, 
test scores are going to go up. There's a very simple thing right here, right? Drug use goes down, test scores go up. That's all I'm saying. So even if the students do reduce their drug use and their own test scores could still go up. So my plan still works. So now we're stuck with B, the one we didn't know what was going on. Over the past five years, Longview Prep has not changed its curriculum. Wait a minute. By shifting the primary focus, focus from imparting knowledge to development of critical thinking and research skills. Now let's go back and look at something. Let's clean this up a little bit. Remember this detail, tests of general knowledge in the passage. Who's talking about tests of general knowledge? This is a detail that came up twice. State issue test scores down here too, right? State issue test scores and tests of general knowledge. Well, this choice is saying changes curriculum by change shifting the primary focus, primary focus, the primary focus from imparting knowledge to development of critical thinking and research skills. Well, wait a minute. If they have changed their curriculum focus and they're no longer focused on imparting knowledge, isn't that kind of wreck argument? Like the argument doesn't work anymore because now we have a whole other fly in the ointment. This person's assuming that there's no other issue. It could be that state issue test scores over the past five years, look at this detail. You pick up this detail and it's here. Over the past five years, over the last five years, means basically the same thing. They've changed its curriculum to from imparting knowledge to development of critical. Well, that would wreck the whole thing because now you're not really even sure why the test scores went down. And now you can say, you know, Bob, maybe the test scores went down because we changed the curriculum. And so if we reduce drug use, nothing is going to happen, right? So at that point, his evidence no longer supports his conclusion. So B is the best answer of lunch. And a lot of people are, okay. Okay, people are asking why E is wrong. E is wrong because all this person is saying is that if we reduce drug use, scores are going up. It won't hurt that if, if the students reduce drug use on their own, okay? We don't need the plan. He never said this plan is necessary. Okay, it's the, the conclusion is not that we need to do this. The conclusion is not that if we don't do this, their scores are never gonna go up. All the person is saying is if we reduce drug use by using these classes, the scores will go up to the levels at which they were. He's not saying we're gonna, he's not saying that we're gonna increase these scores infinitely. They're just gonna bounce up to where they were. We don't need the students, we don't need them to not do it on their own. If they do, if a lot of them do it on their own, then who knows, the plan could work even better. Because it's the conclusion is not that this is the only way or that it's necessary or anything else. All he's saying is the scores will go back up to where they were if we get rid of drug use. I hope that's clear at this point. Yeah, exactly. Okay, one more critical reasoning question, a little tougher. And this one also has a lesson to learn, but let's see if there's any key lessons here. One lesson, if you don't know what the choice is doing, then keep it. Second lesson, pay. The biggest lesson from this one, pay super close attention to the conclusion. And look what our arrows told us. Drug use went up, scores went down. If we can make drug use go down, okay, scores will go up. That's all this person is saying. And the arrows told us the whole thing. And so if we know the direction of what's going on, then we're good. That was a key, uh, a key thing is understanding that conclusion perfectly. Okay, one more critical reason question.
Okay, let's go through this one. Read the passage first. The moderately large city is redesigning its central downtown area and considering a plan that would reduce the number of lanes for automobiles and trucks and increase those for pedestrians and bicycles. So we're reducing. Look, you know, if we pay attention to direction, it's so clear what's going on here. That we're reducing lanes for some people and increasing lanes for the intent is to attract more shoppers and workers by making downtown easier to reach and more pleasant to move around. And so our goal is also an up arrow. We're going to reduce lanes for some people, increase them for others. And our goal is we're going to attract more shoppers and workers. Okay. Which of the following which most strongly support, support the prediction that the plan would achieve its goal? So we need this is a strengthen question. We want to strengthen this up arrow that we're going to attract more workers and shoppers by reducing lanes for some people and increasing them for others so okay we have to look and find something that's going to make this up arrow happen and convinces us ups the odds increases the odds that it's going to work and there's a couple of things we don't want to do we don't want to make up a story and we want to use logic Right? We want to use logic to support our choice. And there's an, there's an interesting couple things about this question. We'll see as we go through. Okay, so let's look at A. People who make a habit of walking or bicycling whenever feasible derive significant health benefits from doing so. That's pretty cool. But what was our conclusion? Remember, the conclusion is so important. The conclusion is we're going to track more workers and shoppers. Right? We're going to track more workers and shoppers. Do we need them to get health benefits in order to attract them does that does that convince us that we're going to attract more you know what the truth is this was going on all along they could people could derive significant health benefits before we put these lanes in right so this is not new this is not something that's changing does it really help us to uh, that these people derive significant health benefits i don't know you know the problem is this is really supporting that this might be better for our, this might be a good idea. Okay. If our conclusion was, if our conclusion were that this is a good idea, this will be good for our town. Then yes, it matters that people derive significant health benefits because we'd be like, well, I don't know. There are going to be fewer people in the hospital. There are going to be more healthy people. Everyone's going to be happier and healthier. That's great. But our conclusion is not that. It's not that it's good for our town. This conclusion is specific. It will attract more workers and shoppers. And the fact that it's that people are healthy because they ride a bicycle, you know, that doesn't convince me that it's going to attract more shoppers than already there. These people already could have derived significant health benefits without these lanes. So this makes this is not a strength. It supports the relationship between this choice and the passage. If we really want to specify it, is that it supports the wrong conclusion. Let's look at B. Most people who prefer to shop at downtown malls instead of uh, downtown urban areas do so because parking is easier and cheaper at the former. You know, I'm not sure what this has to do with adding lanes. But it says parking is easier and cheaper at the former. And what we park is a car. And we're getting, the plan is to get rid of lanes for cars. So if anything, if by making people have a harder time using their automobiles you know we're kind of going against this right because people go to these suburban malls because they can park they can use their cars so the relationship between this choice and the passage is if anything it's a weakening how about c in other moderately large moderately sized cities where measures were taken to make downtowns more accessible for walkers and cyclists that's kind of what we're talking about here downtown businesses began to thrive you know, it says downtown businesses began to thrive. Is that the same thing we're talking about? The other thing is I have heard that the GMAT doesn't really like a choice about another city. You know, doesn't like a choice about another city. And this is about other cities, you know, but can we really strengthen an argument about one city with a statement about another city? I kind of like this choice. It's kind of logical that it would support the argument, sort of. But I don't know that I really like it. So let's continue on. D. 
If the proposed lane restrictions on drivers were rigorously enforced, more people would likely be attracted to downtown businesses than would otherwise be under the plan. This sounds great. Proposed lane restrictions are rigorously enforced. More people will be attracted. This is what we were, uh, more people will likely be attracted to downtown businesses. Isn't that our goal? Than would otherwise be under the plan. I don't know. That one sounds pretty good. Let's let's keep seeing D so far. How about E? Most people who own and frequently ride bicycles for recreational purposes live at significant distance from downtown urban areas. Huh. So these people live far away. I don't know how we draw an arrow for far away, but let's do this one. We live far away. Does that convince me that we're going to have more of them coming if we give them the ability to ride bicycles? The fact that they live far away? I'd say, if anything, that shows me that they're going to not want to do it. So I'm going to say that this goes against my plan, if anything. I'm not really sure what it does. I don't know. What about people who do live in the city? Maybe they'll come. So I don't know if this really kills my plan. But if anything, it's saying that the people who ride bicycles live far away. So why would they even come to my downtown? I think it goes against. So we're down to the infamous last two choices. We have a choice that does something that I've heard the GMAT doesn't do, which is use what's going on in one city to, uh, to, uh, to, to strengthen an argument about this city. And then, you know, a different city to strengthen an argument about this city. And then D is saying something about the plan. It sounds really relevant, right? So D is very tempting because we would try to find choices that are relevant. So I, this, these two are definitely an infamous last two choices. And, we, and when we see two, the, the last two choices, we have to be so careful because one is going to be a pseudo choice. It's going to pseudo do what we want. So which one pseudo does it? You know, I'm kind of leaning towards C at first because it doesn't pseudo do anything. It does say that other moderately sized cities had, you know, that made downtowns more accessible, so all their businesses begin to thrive. The only way businesses really begin to thrive is because people can get there. So it kind of sort of makes sense that this would do it. So, but now we have to eliminate D. So um, let's read D carefully. If the proposed lane restrictions on drivers are rigorously enforced, more people would be attracted to downtown businesses. And if I read the whole thing, the last few words, then would otherwise be under the plan. Do you notice what D is doing? It's comparing the plan with itself. It's basically saying if everything is rigorously enforced, if we have this plan, then under the plan, more people will show up. So cars aren't driving in the bike lanes and people aren't getting run over on the sidewalk or whatever is going on. If that's not happening, this plan will work better than it will if they're not rigorously enforced and everything is helter-skelter. It's comparing the plan with itself. Does this say anything about the plan is going to be better than not having the plan? No, it's just what this is all about, what would happen under the plan. So this D, now I see why this is a pseudo choice. Because even though it looks relevant, it says more people will be likely to be attracted. Very cool. And it talks about the plan. It actually compares the plan to itself. How subtle. How sophisticated. And that's a that's a cool, that's a very cool. By the way, I rewrote this choice a little bit because I actually didn't like it 100%. It doesn't say under the plan in the official version, which I think is a mistake. But I wanted to make it a little more sophisticated, a little better. I don't want any arguments. <laughs> or somebody saying, well, this question isn't that good because it doesn't really make clear what's going on. So, yeah, anyway, that's a fairly sophisticated choice, right? And that's what that's what we're going to see in a hard critical reasoning question. It's something that looks so relevant. It really affects things. But it doesn't do the job for some subtle reason. It's a pseudo strengthener. C is correct. It, we're only left with C. And here's the thing. We have all heard that the GMAT does this. They doesn't like when we compare one city, when we use information about one city to strengthen we can assumption, uh, 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 a question about another city. But we have to be so careful of people saying what the GMAT does because you know where they get that? There's maybe two questions way back when in the GMAT prep test or in the official guide that did something sort of like that. But the GMAT, there's new question writers, first of all, so they might feel a little differently about things. And also, not every situation is the same. And look what they did here. They gave us a tell. The question writer gave us a tell. It says moderately large city here. 
and moderately sized city here. Come on. This question writer is telling us that this is about the same thing, that we can compare. That's something that what choice he says can strengthen the argument. It's the same basic side, you know, the same basic idea. If it said a tiny little town, then maybe it wouldn't work. If it said like a countryside, then maybe it wouldn't work. But it's just a moderately large city. Come on. It's basically about the same thing. And anybody, you know, if we're just being logical, then we can say what applies in one moderately large city probably is going to work in another moderately large city. It certainly gives us more support for our prediction that the plan is going to work, right? And, you know, the other thing, it says downtown businesses began to thrive. It doesn't say that more shoppers came, but we can also use a little common sense and say if downtown businesses began to thrive, then more workers and shoppers probably did show up. Okay. And anyway, D is out. A is certainly out. You know, it doesn't, it supports the wrong conclusion. B is out because it weakens. E is out basically a weakener. So, okay, we're stuck with C. It works. We're good. The question works. It was gettable, you know, and if you use a sophisticated approach, you're going to get this right. Let's check your question. This is a pretty hard question. Yeah, I mean, if people are asking about the other city, you know, that's just, you get the idea. You, and if this goes for sentence correction or anything else, these things that you hear the GMAT has done, be a little careful with that because somebody just saw an old GMAT question. You know, somebody saw an old GMAT question and said, this is what the GMAT does. Well, it's what the GMAT did in 2005. It's what the GMAT did in 1998, you know, on one question. But is it the same as this question? No. So, and you know, and may use a different question, right? So just be, use your logic, analyze the choices, and you know, don't, don't be too into what the GMAT does because what the GMAT does might not be the, quite the same in this question and might have evolved. Okay, let's take a one minute break. If anybody wanted to uh, enter to win the, uh, the GMAT Club test or the Target Test Prep subscription, click on the link. If you haven't already, And someone's asking, meanwhile, about practicing the questions older than five years old. You can practice the old questions. You'll certainly learn from them. I mean, my point is kind of like that one, what happens in one question, even in a new question, you might see something and say, well, this is what the GMAT always does. But you might be making a generalization that doesn't really make sense. Or you might be picking up on something that's very specific to that question, you know, which is basically the same thing. Yeah, you can practice with older questions. Although I would say some of the older sentence correction questions that are super into idioms or something, you're probably not going to have to fight that when you take the, the test today. The test has become a little more meaning-based, uh, a little more sophisticated. The other thing is they know people from all over the world are taking the test. So they don't expect everybody that's, you know, learned English as their second language to know these little idiom things. So they're not really doing that anymore. So some of the older questions... Um, that have to kind of rest on some idiomatic construction is probably not going to apply to what you're doing today. Also, some of the older sentence correction questions aren't actually that well written, which is part of the reason why people say, well, these questions are so subjective. <laughs> yeah, some of the old ones were subjective. They were, they were kind of ridiculous to the point where, you know, there's a comparison that one of them uses the word had in one version and did in another, and you're supposed to say, well, did is better. I mean, the had works perfectly. So that was kind of subjective. So some of the older SC questions are a little subjective in these idioms. But generally, you can uh, practice with older questions. I didn't mean to say that. I'm more saying that you can't generalize from what sort of you saw very specific to one question and say, oh, this is what the GMAT always does. You just have to be so careful. You know, there's a lot of rumors out there that float around in the GMAT world, people preparing, oh, this is what you need to do. This is what the GMAT does. Just be a little careful with that. Any flip little thing. That's what I'm saying.
you know, to be sure. No, I, anyway, okay. You don't need to answer just used questions just from 2015, uh, 2015 on. In fact, the, qu the questions from 2015 are from 2010. Whatever, right? Use all kinds of questions. I practice with all kinds of crummy questions and good questions. It all works out because you just use some judgment, right? You can use an old question and go, you know what? I think this seems a little off, but I'm still learning from it. Use judgment and, and use the questions. Let's move on to RC. Okay, R, agreed and comprehension. To master this, the first thing we want to do is learn best practices for reading passages, okay? This is key. There's ways to read passages and there's ways not to read passages such as don't just read the first sentence of each paragraph, you know, things like that. The best practice for reading passages includes things like don't not getting bogged down in details, noticing what the key points are, being ready to summarize it, things like that. Another best practice is just as we saw in critical reasoning, read the passage before the first question, especially, I mean, you could argue that maybe it helps you to read the, first, the, the question before the passage in critical reasoning, but it is not gonna help in reading comprehension because you need to see all what's going on in the passage. You need to understand it. You need to know where the details are because there are gonna be questions about all different aspects of the passage, right? So read the passage before you read the first question. That's your best practice for reading passages. There's some other stuff we talk about in the course. You get the idea. If you know your best practices, you're setting yourself up for a good foundation for reading comprehension. The second is learn effective strategies. Just as we were talking about for the other types of verbal questions, if you have effective strategies, you're going to be set up when you take the test to get through questions accurately, efficiently, and, and effectively, uh, If even if you're just distracted, right? Even if you're tired, because you know exactly what you need to do. You have a strategy, you're set up, you've done this the same way 20 times or 50 times or 100 times or 1,000 times. So you're ready to rock. You know, oh, it says it's an inference question. Okay, I read the question stem very carefully first. I look for keywords. I find where the information is in the passage. You do all these things. It just becomes instinctive. You know exactly what to do. Finally, to master reading comprehension, we have to practice to develop skill in these two things. One of them is telling the difference between trap choices and correct answers, right? We saw this in critical reasoning. There's the pseudo choices. There's always pseudo choices. And they do this. It's huge in reading comprehension. They write the, the incorrect choices to look just like the passage. They seem to fit it perfectly. You want to choose that choice, right? So we have to get so good at telling the difference between those trap choices and correct answers, and which is the flip side of the second thing we're practicing, is determining which choice fits or is supported by the passage. So we have to see which are incorrect and notice and know what kind of traps they throw at us. And we have to also be able to see how one choice is supported, like what kind of information supports the choice. And you have to practice is going to make perfect. It's not, you're not going to get to uh, reading comprehension mastery just by learning the strategies and learning the best practices. You actually have to practice executing because so much of this verbal is so much about execution, you know? I mean, for quant, if you don't know how to answer a combination question and then someone shows you how to do it, you can go from zero to 60 in a second. You can go from not knowing anything about combinations questions to getting them right in an hour, right? An hour later, you're getting them all correct. And then before you had no idea. Okay, great. Reading comprehension isn't like that. Critical reasoning isn't like that. You have to learn how to execute. You have to learn, wait, you know, I have to keep that answer even if I don't understand it. I have to, I shouldn't just, oh, if I get tired at the end of a sentence correction question, I shouldn't choose e, uh, choice E just because I'm worn out. I should keep choices that I... Uh, that I'm not sure about in my back pocket, even if I've eliminated them, or even if I've confidently eliminated a choice, I'm going to keep that in my back pocket. I might have to go back to that choice, even if it looked terrible the first time around. These are the kind of things you learn to do by practicing. And so practice is super important in verbal. So let's hit our first passage. As usual, please hold off on your choices until everyone's had a chance.
Okay, let's go through this one. And when we're reading these passages, we definitely want to understand them, but there's but we don't want to get bogged down in the details. And this passage has a lot of details in it, right? So it's definitely a good passage to learn to read for meaning and read to understand, but not get totally bogged down. We can't always, you know, totally process every detail. A lot of people ask me how to speed up in reading comprehension. And the way to speed up, one way to speed up in GMAT reading comprehension is to go through and, you know, read the passage and you're not going to skim, but you don't necessarily have to totally get every detail and you certainly don't have to remember every detail. What we're really going to do is just go through and notice where the details are. You notice where the parts of the passage are, right? So the two things we're doing when we're reading the passage is reading for meaning, getting the general understanding of what the passage says, and noticing where everything is. That way, when we have questions to answer, we can go back and find it that much more easily, okay? And you can see that reading the entire passage is going to be the way to do both of those things. So, okay, starting at the beginning. In 1994, a team of scientists led by David McKay began studying the meteorite ALH 8400-001. Okay. So there is our first, you know, this is our opening sentence, which had been discovered, okay, in Antarctica in 1984. So they stu began studying the meteorite, which had been discovered. This is our opening sentence is usually key to the passage and uh, sets up everything else. It's not necessarily an important point, but it somehow introduces everything. So it's usually some kind of key part of the thing. Two years later, the McKay team announced that ALH84, the thing, which scientists generally agree originated on Mars, contained compelling evidence that life once existed on Mars. When we see something strong, a strong opinion like that, that's probably really key in the content. They announced something about compelling evidence. That's huge. Okay, that should jump out at us as an important opinion, as a key part of the passage. This evidence includes the discovery of organic molecules in ALH 84001, the first ever found in Martian rock. Okay, so we're getting into this evidence. Organic molecules form the basis for terrestrial life. The organic molecules found in ALH 84801 uh, yeah, are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs. When microbes die, their organic material often decays into PAHs. Okay, so here's the deal. They, they have found compelling evidence, we saw that, that life once existed on Mars. And we can basically see from reading this without getting totally clear about carbon-based compounds and organic molecules, you know, they form the basis for life. When microbes die, their organic material often decays into these things, right? Okay. So you get the idea that this is why that they say this is compelling evidence because microbes die, they turn into PAHs. So this is our compelling evidence. So the first paragraph is basically saying that these guys found this thing. They made this announcement as they're saying it's compelling evidence that life is on Mars. And when microbes die, they're the organic. And the reason is because when microbes die, they make the stuff that was found in the rock. Okay, the organic molecules found in it. Do we need to know anything else about all these? No, right? That's the, that's all we need to know from this first paragraph. Okay, we can come back. If it says something about carbon compounds, you can come back. The first ever found in Martian rock, it says the first ever. Do we need to remember that? You know, not necessarily. Just we need to get the basic idea. Okay, then the next paragraph, skepticism about the McKay team's team claims remains. Okay, the skepticism remains, however... When we see, however, this is probably an important point. Does that mean that we only look at the keyword, however? No, it's just signaling something. And, you know, I've seen people go through these RPC passages and notice all these keywords. However, therefore, for example, here's for example, here's another one. Keyword. All they notice is the keywords. You know, it's great that you know the keywords. It's great that you study the concepts. But we need to understand these passages, okay? So we're not just looking at the keywords. Skepticism about McKay team's claim remains, however. For example, ALA, this thing has been on Earth for 13,000 years, suggesting to some that its pHs might have resulted from terrestrial contamination. So there's one example of a reason why the skepticism exists. However, McKay team has demonstrated the concentration of pHs increases when one looks deeper into ALH 8401, contrary to one would expect from terrestrial contamination. So they're going back and forth. 
right? These people are saying, look, it might have resulted from terrestrial com com contamination. And the McKay team is saying, well, contrary to what we expect, right? The skeptic's strongest argument, however, here's however again, and the strongest argument and opinion, this is usually super important, is that processes unrelated to organic life can easily produce all the evidence found by McKay's team. So this might not have even come from life. For example, star formation produces pHs. Moreover, pHs frequently appear in meteorites and no one attributes the presence to life processes. Then McKay team noticed that the combination, the particular combination of pHs and ALH 8400-001 is more similar to the combinations produced by decaying organisms than to those originating from non-biological processes. That's a lot of details, right? We went back and forth twice. But look at this paragraph. It's really just about this skepticism. Okay? And they went back and forth. So if we need to learn about the skepticism, we did. I did see something about terrestrial contamination, but honestly, I'm already like, I already like, I don't know. I'm getting bogged down in these details. You know, it's easy to wonder, to get stuck, get super slowed down. You're wondering what all this means. Don't do it. You realize there's an argument. There's a couple points. If you don't 100% get those points, you know, the po just remember why they're there. They're there to show us that these people are arguing back and forth. And if we need to go back, we know where all the argument was. It's in paragraph two. Okay, so now we've read this passage. We got the general idea. We can summarize it very simply. McKay's team started studying this thing, which had been discovered in Antarctica. Two years later, they announced that it contained compelling evidence that life once existed on Mars because the stuff found in it is something that normally happens when microbes die. And then, however, there's skepticism about it that we can go back and forth on a couple points. That's it. Now, we go to the first question. The passage asserts which of the following about the claim. Oh, okay. I jumped ahead on the questions because I. Okay, fine. The passage asserts the primary purpose of the passage is to describe new ways of studying the possibility that life once existed on Mars. Is it? To describe, uh, the question is, I'm sorry, the primary purpose of the passage is to X. So we know it's a primary purpose question. And we know that we have to determine what the, uh, what the primary purpose of the passage was. Well, we know what the passage did. We, we went through there. First explain what McKay found, you know, what they announced and the reason for it. And then it showed an argument. That's all it did. And, it, you know, if we need to get more detail with that, we will. But right now we know that the primary purpose seems to be to show what they talked, what they found, and then discuss an argument about it. I don't know. What else could it possibly be? Now, the key with RC is we constantly compare answer choices with the passage. Okay. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at each choice and carefully compare it with the passage. Because remember, our key thing about RC is that we have to be able to tell the difference between trap choices and correct answers. And the way we're gonna do that is to go back to the passage and compare. So, A, primary purpose of the passage is to describe new ways of studying the possibility that life once existed on Mars. It does describe something, so this choice does start off correctly. The passage does describe something. Now, does, let's continue with this choice because reading comprehension choices, we need to read the entire thing beginning to end. Describe new ways. There's anything of studying the possibility that life was, did we ever see any new ways of studying the possibility? We saw one thing, that they looked at this rock, or this uh, meteorite, and they and they decided that it contained compelling evidence. But it just, do we have any other ways of studying the possibility that life was existed on Mars? No. So we're not describing new ways. By the way, all this other stuff, all this other stuff in the second paragraph is not about anything about new ways. It's about a controversy. It's about an argument. So it, this a the primary purpose of the passage. I don't know if you studied this, but if you haven't, you need to know this concept. The primary purpose of the passage has to cover the entire passage. So by knowing that concept and knowing the strategy of comparing the choice with the entire passage, you get rid of that. Okay. So concept and strategy work together. And if we practice, 
We get it. Second, B, revise a theory regarding the existence of light on, life on Mars in light of new evidence. You know, the, the, the passage does mention new evidence, right? We did see it up here. Has been discovered, and they contain compelling evidence. So this choice could certainly seem correct. But we have to carefully compare, what's our strategy? Carefully compare the choice of the entire passage. Do we see anything about revising? I don't see anything about where is the theory revised? It's paragraph paragraph one. Is it theory revised? No, it just explains what it is. Paragraph two, is it revised? No, people argue with it. Nothing revises. And if we know the strategy of looking for verbs in reading comprehension choices, we know that revise doesn't work. And it, you know, honestly, I don't even see really a theory, to be honest. Is it really a theory? You know, so there is some new evidence, but we don't revise anything and there isn't a theory. So B is out just by comparing with the passage, concept and strategy. And we can use the same one. Reconcile is a verb. If we know, once again, to look for verbs in RC. Reconcile. Do you see any conflicting viewpoints? Get reconcile. Already C is looking so suspicious. And look, this is not the easiest question, by the way. But if we're careful, we know our concepts and we know our strategies then we're good. It has to go, the primary purpose question has to go with the whole passage. And we need to check the verbs and reckon, not, reconcile doesn't work there at all. And if we continue with this choice, it does mention conflicting viewpoints. So this choice is, that's why it's a trap, right? There are conflicting viewpoints. It does bring up conflicting viewpoints, but it's only the second paragraph for the presented. But even that could be okay, but it certainly doesn't reconcile them. So it's this is a half right choice. And if you know your half right trap choices in RC, you're going to be you're ahead of the game already because you know to read the whole choice. And regarding the possibility that life once existed on Mars, look at that. The choice starts off wrong and ends wrong because they're not arguing about whether life existed on Mars. They're arguing about whether this rock is evidence of it, whether these PAHs in the rock are evidence of the uh, conflicting viewpoints. So, uh, or, or, <laughs> yeah, the evidence of whether the it, life is on Mars. So this is out. Evaluate a recently proposed argument concerning the origin of AL8-84001. You know, this is funny because this does look like an evaluation, doesn't it? I mean, the verb certainly seems to work, right? I think the verb basically works. It says evaluate it. This second paragraph, it does bring up the argument. And then this paragraph does sort of seem to evaluate it. Uh, but it, does it come to any conclusion? You know, when you evaluate something, I would think you'd have an evaluation, and I don't see one. So this choice is looking a little suspicious. But what's our key strategy for reading comprehension? Our key strategy is we read the entire choice. Right? That's what we're talking about. Read the entire choice. Evaluate a recently proposed argument concerning the origin of ALH 84001. Do we see any argument about the origin? No. They're arguing about something completely different. So how cool is that? If you just read, I mean, here, the choices basically seem sort of correct up to this point. Excuse me. The choice basically seems correct up to that point, but it's not. Okay? But after that point, the origin, nobody's arguing about the origin of this thing. They all agree that we uh, discovered in the McKay team, which is generally agreed to originate on Mars, Okay, so they're not arguing about the origin. They're arguing about something else. E, describe a controversy concerning the significance of that evidence from ALH 84001. Well, definitely we are. We bring up uh, the evidence, which is all up here in the first paragraph. And then the current controversy shows up here. So I don't know. You know, the controversy seems to sort of be in the second paragraph. But it, the first paragraph introduces it. So yeah, this choice works. We can compare it with the whole passage. And you know, this does illustrate one key thing with RC, that sometimes with these primary purpose questions, the first sentence, the first paragraph is not the most key thing to the primary purpose. In this case, the second paragraph is much closer to what the correct answer says, because the controversy is all discussed in, you know, in paragraph two. So paragraph one becomes an introduction, and paragraph two is really the meat of this thing, okay? So don't just say, this gives us a great illustration of why we don't just go with the first sentence 
or the first paragraph of the passage and call that the primary purpose, right? Lesson learned. So this is a pretty cool question. And let me check your questions real quick. Okay. Okay, next. Let's go on to the next question. And this is a detailed question. I already wrote all over this thing. Let's do it. I'll give you a few minutes and let's get this one right. Remember to carefully compare with the passage. That's going to be our biggest thing in our city. Okay, let's go through this one. Carefully compare with the passage and, and get it correct. The passage asserts which of the following about the claim that ALH 8401 or 84001 originated on Mars. Okay, so we're looking for something about this claim. And the whole passage is kind of about this claim. So this is a little tough, right? Um, you know, uh, the whole, actually, the whole passage is not about this claim. I'm sorry. Which of the following is about the claim that 8400, ALH 84001 originated on Mars? Okay, this is a very specific thing. This is, this is key. We always have to read the question carefully. And you know what? A lot of us, including me just for a second there, was thinking that this was about the claim that life, that this proved that life uh, uh, existed on Mars, but this is not the claim that this this question is about. We have to, so lesson number one: be so careful when you read the question. It's you know it's 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 points on the board. It's points on the board when you're answering these RC questions to read the question carefully because that's one way they can trick you. So you can check that off just by reading the question carefully. So this is about the claim that this thing originated on Mars. Well, where is that discussed? It's not in the second paragraph. The second paragraph is all about the skepticism, the argument, the whole thing. So where is this discussed? The claim that it originated on Mars. Look for the key words in the passage. Mars is capitalized, but it's going to be tough. To, you know, Mars is all through this thing. Um, so where are we going to, uh, where are we going to find this, uh, this, this, uh, this information for answering the question? Detail question, use the keywords. I see originated. That's probably our best keyword for this thing. And sure enough, I see originated on Mars right here in the first paragraph, sort of where we knew it was going to be discussed right near the beginning. Did you remember that? You probably did. Okay. A, it was initially proposed by the McKay team of scientists. They certainly want us to think that. This is a trap choice. It's called a nearby trap. If you know your RC traps, you know the McKay team is right by here. And it's nearby to re-originate on Mars. So you might want to choose A. But does the McKay team announce that this thing originally on Mars? No. The McKay team announced that it contained compelling evidence that lights once existed on Mars. So certainly it was not, it doesn't say according to the passage. Does the passage assert this? No. Okay. 
It doesn't assert it. The passage doesn't support it. A correct answer to a detailed question has to be supported by the passage. B, it is not a matter of widespread scientific dispute. Uh, that sounds a little funny to me, you know, it's, but it seems possible that this is correct. It says scientists generally agree that it originated on Mars. So if they generally agree, it's probably not a matter of widespread scientific dispute. And here's a cool thing. They do this all the time. Notice what this choice does. It says they generally agree. And this said it's not a matter of widespread scientific dispute. So those are kind of the opposite of each other. It's sort of meaning the same thing. If you don't agree, if you do agree, then there's no dispute. They do this all the time. If you know about this type of choice, you're kind of well prepared to see it in the RC questions. So that's probably going to be our correct answer. Uh, C, it has been questioned by some skeptics of the McKay team's work. Nobody's questioned this. They're skeptic skeptical about something entirely different, about the significance of these PAHs, right? Does it say anything about Mars in the second paragraph? No. Okay, so the skepticism, the skeptics don't care. It has been undermined by recent work on PAHs. Notice this whole thing, the, the key to this whole question is really trying to get us to think that the if we didn't read the question correct, we're done. Because we're talking about the wrong claim. So now we're fighting our way through these choices. And we're saying this is a matter of, you know, if we, if we read the question stem wrong, we're going to think this is out. And all these start looking, it's been undermined by recent work. You know, well, this is the McKay team's claim. Oh, man. But it was also, you know, proposed by the McKay team. But you know what could really save you if you did that? That in that case, like three or four answer choices are going to look correct. So what do you do? You go back and reread the question. If all the answer choices are looking correct, you know, and then you go, wait a minute, let me go back to the question stem. The passage asserts which of the following about the claim that ALH 8401 originated on Mars. Oh, I got the wrong claim. So if you're going through the choices and, and everything's working, something is up. And you can do two things. Bounce back to the passage is certainly going to work, but also bounce back to the question. And the same thing goes for DS. If you're going through, you're like, well, I don't know, this is something wrong with this. Any question, you can bounce back to the question stem and get a lot out of it. Critical reason. You might have read it and thought it was a weakened question. It's actually a strengthened question. If you're really having trouble eliminating choices, one of your moves, bounce back to the question stem. Okay, D. It has been undermined by recent work on PAHs. No. The claim that it originated on Mars is not undermined by anything. It is incompatible with the fact that ALH has been on Earth for 13,000 years. We could make this up in our minds that that's you know, it's incompatible with that fact it's been on Earth for 13,000 years, but just the passage support it. Compare with the passage, uh, which can be discovered in Antarctica. Let's find, does it say 13,000 years? It says it here. But this is part of a whole other argument. It doesn't say anything about the fact whether this thing originated on Mars and being on Earth for 13,000 years, right? This is brought up for a whole other reason, Okay. So this is out to, you just compare it with the passage. But back to B. It is not a matter of widespread scientific dispute. It's certainly correct. A lot of you got this. Nice job comparing with the passage. And B is the correct answer. Let me see what your questions are. Okay. I think everyone kind of got this. And uh, so we don't really need to go through this. Um, question anymore we're gonna i'm gonna wrap up in a minute uh we're gonna do one more draw too so let's let's talk a little bit about how to practice for uh verbal because a lot of people don't hit their gm or have trouble hitting their gmat verbal score just because uh, they're not practicing effectively this is so key I, you know every day someone says to me man i really you know i've been practicing i've been using a ttp course and my, my GMAT verbal score is just not what I want it to be yet. What is going on? What do I have to do? And day after day, I tell them, do these three things, or do these things. Do your practice topic focus, okay? So learn the, the, the um, do one question type at a time. Do weekend questions one after the other. That way, you can apply what you learned when you, got, when you did one question to, to the next question. Your skill is getting better in that specific topic area. Okay, topic focused practice works great. You learn to apply your concepts and get better and better and better at applying certain concepts. Second one, this is maybe the best, the biggest one of all. Practice on time. Okay. And you know, and I'm not saying practice on time till the day before your test. 
because then you show up for the test and you're like, wait, I'm used to spending 15 minutes per question and now I only have two. Okay, that's not going to work out. But most of the time, do your verbal practice and honestly, even your quant practice on time. If you don't gain anything by cutting yourself off at two minutes and getting questions wrong, it works much better to learn to get them right, even if it takes you an hour per question. And I'm, you know, not many people need an hour per question, but some people do. And I've seen it. Somebody told me, yeah, I'm spending, you know, it's common for people to spend a half hour per question, honestly, on verbal questions. And you know what? That's fine. Just practice on time. Learn to get them right first. You need high accuracy to get a high verbal score. You know, you need to get like if you want to score in the 40s, you have to get nine, over 90 percent or about 90 percent of the questions correct. Right. So and that's including that's medium and hard. If you're scoring in the 40s, by the way, you're not even going to see any easy verbal questions. So you have to be able to get something like 90% of the medium and hard questions you see correct if you want to score in the fours and verbals. And the way you're going to learn to do that is practicing on time, right? And it's it's cool. You get to analyze all the choices and see other relationships. The, the questions are cool. They're well written. Um, there was one guy I saw recently on GMAT Club saying that he was practicing GMAT verbal. He was doing eight or 10 questions a day, and he had a nice high verbal score. Uh, he was real happy with, and he was doing about eight or 10 questions a day on time, analyzing every choice. And the other thing is, we'll go to this next, understand every choice, okay? As we saw, we want to understand every choice. And by the way, you're saying, well, I'm only doing 10 or 15 or, you know, certainly not 30 or 50 questions a day, but you're doing five choices per question. So if 10 questions becomes 50 choices, 50 chances to analyze carefully, that's a lot. You saw, how many questions have we done here? We've been on for three hours. We did four sentence correction, three. We did four and three, that's seven plus two. We did nine questions in three hours. I mean, it's not quite three hours, but and we've done a few other things. But still, okay, you get the idea. You know, you, and that's about how much time you need to spend on the questions to really see what's going on in every choice. And that's how you learn to do this, to so understand every choice. When you get to the infamous last choice is our next point. Okay, when you get to these infamous last two choices, don't give up. You really have to stick it out with the infamous last two choices. And a lot of time there's going to be a pseudo choice or a really cool trap choice, especially in the harder questions. You're going to say, I don't know which one of these is correct. And you're going to be so tempted to guess. Don't do it. Stick it out until you decide which of those infamous last two choices is correct. Make sure you see it. That's how you're going to excel. If you can't get the infamous last two choices correct in practice, you're not going to get it correct next time or on the test, right? You have to stick with it so that when you do the question for real, you can get to the end of it. So practice getting to the end, even if in the beginning it takes you a half hour per question, fine. It took me, man, it took me, you know, 20 minutes to just to figure out the last two choices. Do it. And you know what? Next time it'll take you 15. The next time it'll take you 10. The next time it'll take you five. And you're learning how to get through those infamous last two choices. Because really, I mean, when you get right down to it, if you're any good at all at GMAT verbal, you're really choosing between the last two answer choices in a GMAT verbal question, right? That's what really is going on because you're going to eliminate those first three, no problem, most of the time. So what you're really practicing is, is eliminating one of the last two choices. So stick out those last two choices. Next, become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah, choosing between the last two choices is going to be uncomfortable. You uh, you can feel physically ill. You can be angry at the question. You can be like, I can't stand this, or it's beating up my confidence, all these things. Be comfortable with that. That's what it's going to feel like when you're taking the test too. Be totally comfortable with, with you know fighting your way through these questions. Man, I can still look at these, some of these questions after all these years, and I can look at the question and go, man, these two choices look exactly the same. And how, does, how comfortable does that feel for me, having done this for all this time, you know? And I have to sit there and sweat it out and look, did I look at the non-underlined portion? Is there some key difference? What's the difference between these two choices? What, is, what really matters here? Analyze these two choices just like anyone else. And it's uncomfortable. It's emotionally uncomfortable. It's mentally uncomfortable. It's painful. I don't see the difference. What's going on? Stick it out. Become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Finally, we must work with carefully to avoid careless mistakes. Got to avoid carefully when you're practicing. That's the whole, you notice, it's so easy to miss these if you miss a verb or you miss a certain, you know, that a pronoun doesn't work with something or you just go for a choice that sounds good. You have to be so careful. 
GMAT verbal, there, I don't know, being careful is 30% of it. It's so cool because, by the way, if you're more careful, you might drive your score up 20 points or 30 points or 70 points just by being more careful. I had a student that was taking the GMAT. She got ticked off because she messed up the quant section. So she really was super intense and verbal, and she scored, I don't know, three to five points higher than she ever had before, even on any of her practice tests. You know, that's 30, that's 30 to 50 points on your test just by being more intense and careful. Okay, and always analyze the question and, address, and figure out why you missed it and address that issue, right? We have to know why we missed a question and we have to address that issue. Did you not know a concept? Go back and learn it. Did you not execute well? Then do what you have to do to execute better the next time. Address your issues, figure out why you're missing questions and address those issues, okay? That's how you're gonna make progress. You're not gonna make progress without you know, doing the same thing. I guess that's pretty obvious. So anyway, every time you do a question, if you miss it, figure out why you missed it and figure out how to address that. Next, don't be surprised if it's not easy. This is the GMAT. It's a test for getting into graduate school. Of course, the, you know you think, oh, verbal, it's just a bunch of words. It's just a bunch of passages. It's no different from a lot of things I do. So what could be so hard about it? Okay, well, here's the truth. GMAT verbal is pretty tough. And in fact, for a lot of people, it's tougher than quant, you know, because we've all been doing math. We all learn, you know, or most of us learned FOIL back in the eighth grade or something, you know, or whatever it is. So that can actually feel pretty easy. You know, you're scoring 40 in, in quant and then you're scoring 22 in verbal. It's like, whoa, this is so hard. Don't be surprised. OK, it's it's not that easy. It's a meant to be a test to get into graduate school, you know, so. Can we do this kind of sophisticated thinking? It's not easy, don't be surprised, okay? And finally, foster a growth mindset. This is huge, okay? You're fostering a growth mindset and, um, and saying, I can do this. Other people have done it, I can do it too, right? And also, it's completely logical that if you just keep developing yourself, you keep learning strategies and keep learning concepts, you're going to get better at this, right? Like if you didn't know how a modifier works and you learn how like a, a, a participle phrase modifier works, okay, well, now you made a step in a good direction. Of course, your score is going to increase from that. Then you learn a strategy. Well, I never knew to look so carefully at the, at the support for, uh, for the uh, conclusion in an assumption question. Well, now you do. You're going to get assumption questions correct more consistently. And then the practicing is going to help too. You're going to learn how to how to uh, how to execute. Okay, so foster a growth mindset and say, look, if I just keep learning one thing at a time, just like anyone else did, I'm going to learn how to do it. And that is GMAT verbal, how to master it in a nutshell. Let's see what other questions do we have. Okay. Um, in the actual exam, when the timer is clicking, yeah, I don't know. When the timer is clicking on the test, naturally you're going to be a little more, um, you'll be a little more nervous. But if you have solid strategies, if you have solid strategies, you'll, uh, you'll do, you know, then you're, you, even though the clock is ticking, if you're well practiced and well prepared, you're going to be good. Okay. Uh, which section do I recommend, quant or verbal, first? It really depends on you. I always do quant first because I'm a little, a lot better at verbal. So like I go super intense on quant, and then verbal is my kind of like, okay, I'm good now. Some people, but if you know, if I wasn't a lot better at verbal, but a little better, then I might want to do it when I'm fresh because it's my better section. So everybody, uh, everybody has his better or worse section. So you really have, it depends on you. But I would say generally, if you're much better at, at one, then do that second. If you're a little better at one, maybe do that first. Something about the, okay. Okay, these questions, some of them were from TTP and, and most of them were official today. 
because I wanted to grab some old stuff um, so that not everybody would have seen it. And I know a lot of y'all are using the TTP course, so I grabbed some. Some of them are uh, older questions that I grabbed that I, didn't, I thought a lot of people wouldn't have seen already. Uh, I guess that's pretty much it. If you have any other questions, you can email me at Marty at Target Test Prep. Uh, I guess that's pretty much it. So we're going to do another draw at the end of this thing. Uh, you saw that we're, also if you feel like donating to the Ukraine cause, that would be great. Um, that's pretty much how to master GMAT verbal. Uh, you know, clearly there's more concepts that we didn't cover, but I hope the, uh, the general idea of it really got the job done for you. Hope you all learned some, some good things today. It's been really fun doing this. Uh, it's for a good cause too. Uh, happy to see that some people donated. Is and oh, is TTP good? I got some more questions. How hard is it to go from uh, from verbal thirty eight to verbal forty five? Depends. Uh, I've seen people go up six seven points in in pretty quickly because they just had to be more careful. If it's because you need to learn a lot more concepts, then it might be a little harder. But a lot of time what you need to do to score a higher verbal is kind of, um, you kind of need, a lot of it's just changing your mentality, okay? You know, like, well, the, you, like, how are you preparing? Like, what's your mentality about the verbal section? Are you being detailed enough? You know, so, so that's going to be how fast can you change the general overall way you're handling this is going to be a big part of uh, your success in going from the... 38 to v45 is ttp good for non-natives ttp is great for non-natives uh particularly in sentence correction it's super super complete so a lot of non-natives use ttp and say okay finally i'm finding something that's really covering things we also wrote it to be super understandable so that helps as well but the, you know the completeness is really really good especially in the sc because you know you need to know all these rules that you don't necessarily know and you know so we're seeing a lot of non-natives really gravitating toward the TTP course. Does LSAT help with RC and CR? Uh, it can. The, the CR is a little different. You know, some of the choices don't work quite the same or they'll have it, like I saw recently an LSAT question that had two conclusions in one. And you know, so the, which, the answer choice only is this choice that supported one part of the conclusion but not the other wasn't good as good as a choice that supported both conclusions. You know, you won't see that really on the GMAT, at least I never have. Um, or I haven't seen it really working that way. So, you know, is the LSAT stuff perfect? No. Can you learn to see what's going on and execute? Well, yeah, you'll learn that. So if you run out of GMAT verbal questions, you could use LSAT questions, but I would, um, I would, uh, you know, do, if you practice on time and you carefully analyze the verbal questions, choice by choice, the verbal practice questions, then you'll get a lot more mileage out of them. So you won't necessarily need the LSAT question. So if you're starting to practice right now, I would say if you don't want to run out of GMAT verbal qu practice questions, then do them on time and analyze every single choice. In sentence correction, you can look for two hours in a lot of, you know, if the choices are longer, a lot of time there are two hours in each choice. So uh, you won't run out of questions if you're, if you're operating that way. You know, it'll take a lot longer. There's so many official questions. There's so many TTP questions. You can definitely um, you can definitely use get a lot of mileage out of the questions. For how do you improve speed in RC? Do a lot of reading. You know, we uh, find a list of articles, some type of publications you can read, like Scientific American, The Economist, Science Daily is a really fun one if you want to read the science passages. There's so many different science topics. So doing a lot of reading will help you speed up. Also, knowing how to sort of handle the passages and knowing what the keywords are and stuff makes the passages come into focus. And, you know, so if you know that however does a certain thing and therefore does another thing, the passages come into better focus for you, in which case you can read them faster. And I'm not saying to focus on the keywords. I'm saying use the keywords to get through the passages more efficiently. And also, uh, if don't get bogged down in the details. You know, you saw when we went through the passage, that RC passage, that bogging down in the details is not necessary a lot of the time you can like if it says einstein said this and niels bohr said that 
I barely even read that. I'm like, okay, these guys said two different things. They disagree. You know, that kind of thing will get you through. Um, what else do we have going on? Is meaning more important than grammar on SC? Well, meaning is almost always important. I would say they're both important. If you don't see the grammar issues, then something might seem, it might I don't know if it really could mean the right thing if the grammar is messed up, but it's pretty important. And the other thing is that uh, the grammar and the rules, you know, maybe more the modifier rules and some of the other rules tell you whether the meaning is correct. So it's not as if you can skip the rules and say, well, I'll just focus on meaning. Because you need some a lot of the time you need the rules to understand the meaning and whether it's uh, whether it's correct or incorrect or, you know makes sense or doesn't make sense. Uh, prepare consistently when you're working professional. You just have to find out how to carve out the time. You know when I, I ended up when I was preparing for one test, just like studying on the subway, studying on the train. Like finding time, like, man, it was tough, though. I have to admit, I totally understand where you're coming from. I mean, my weekends, I would wake up in the morning, study, fall asleep, study some more, wake up, you know, fall asleep, do whatever, do whatever I had to do. And staying motivated is tough. But, you know, I, if you kind of gamify it, then that helps too. make it fun for yourself. OK, how many questions can I get right today? What percentage can I hit today? That type of thing to keep it, to keep it fun. And look at everything you learn. Instead of looking at the GMAT as a syllabus, look at each thing you learn as a step. Oh, I took another step. My, I came in with a, you know, a, a, a baseline score of 580. But I've taken these 10 steps, so I'm pretty confident that now my score is 640 if I went to take the test. And then you take 10 more to 15 more steps, whatever it is. Now my score would be 680 if I take the test, right? So that kind of keeps you going, too. Like, every step is like money in a bank. Um. When do you start going from untimed to time practice? I mean, in the beginning, it's totally untimed. You kind of work toward time. As I was saying before, you kind of try to work the time down. So as much as you can, right? Like, you don't, you're not necessarily doing time practice. You could still answer the questions in two minutes each, right? Because that's how skilled you are. So if you can get your time down to four minutes per question, and then three minutes per question, and then two minutes per question, you know, you're working the time down. So is it ever time practice? I don't know. And then, but yeah, definitely maybe a few weeks before your test or the last month before your test, start doing consistently doing, you know, if you want to do it with a timer at that point, that's when you should start doing time practices near to your test so that you're not stuck on test day. Like I said, going, oh man, I'm not used to doing this two minutes per question. I'm used to doing it in 10. Uh, okay. Ideal timing for RC, CR, and RC on the test. It's different for everybody. I would say rule of thumb is something like a minute and a half to two minutes on SC, um, something like a minute 45 to 215 on CR, and something like an average of two minutes for each RC if you take it with the passage. Like if it's a four question passage, long passage spend eight minutes on the whole thing or maybe you know six to eight minutes on the whole thing it's a little tough to say though i personally spend less time on critical reason than sentence correction so everybody's a little different we have a blogs and a lot of this stuff if you google any of these things like how to how to prepare for the gmat while working target test prep blog you'll find it timing for gmat verbal g uh, ttp gmat blog you will definitely find it and you know we've written in, in depth on all these things uh in the rc in the rc main point question i eliminated the choice e because of controversy you know it's close enough it was sort of a controversy has a few connotations but there was definitely some kind of argument and skepticism and argument you know type of thing going on so that's close enough to controversy um and there and the other choices really didn't cut it so we have to go with uh we have to go with choice that choice choice e or what was the choice anyway are we, am I sure that a TTP can recreate GMAT questions? Yeah, I'm absolutely sure of that. I mean, did we 100% every one of our questions 
perfectly mimic a GMAT question? No. Do a lot of them? Do most of them? Absolutely. And we spent, uh, we probably did spend thousands writing TTP questions. The TTP practice questions were often reviewed by three, if not four people. They're edited sometimes two, three times. Then we get feedback from the students who are using them. I mean, it's intense. I've spent sometimes, I've spent six hours writing one question, which is basically what a GMAT question writer, you know, spends, writes one to three questions a day. We put, a lot of the time we ended up doing the same thing on the TTP questions. So that's why they came out just as well, because we spend that amount of, we spent, we put that into it. We didn't, we're not writing these questions in 10 minutes each. We don't have, I don't know, there's not an intern in the back writing questions and then we're putting them in the course. Somebody that's been doing GMAT prep for years is spending hours on these questions and then they get reviewed. I guess that's pretty much it. I guess that's pretty much it for, uh, you know, questions. People asking, what do I do if I, um, one last question. What do I do if I exhaust the OG questions, go through them again and use third party questions, you know, and use LSAT questions if you have to. But there's a lot of official questions, there's a lot. And, you know, people say, well, what about third party questions? Man, you can learn so much. You're learning to see what's going on. I've used the worst questions in learning from them. So if you have solid questions like the target test prep questions, you can learn so much. So just keep prepping. Do what you have to do. Use old questions if you have to. I guess our time is pretty much up. So let's call it a day. If you, anyone else has questions, send them to me through the target test prep chat or through uh, email it to me and I can answer it. It's been really fun. I hope you enjoyed it. I really like GMAT Verbal because I think it's a cool logic game. I hope we all learned something today, take some good takeaways, and thanks a lot, y'all.